the board meeting of the North Car of the North Carolina Board of Nursing will now convene. Since this meeting is being held by teleconference, it is being recorded for record purposes. Chandra Graves will conduct an official roll call for declaration of the forum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please respond present when your name is called. Dr. Pam Edwards. Present. Dr. Anne Marie Milner. Present. Arlene Imes. Present. Lynetta Howard. Lynetta Howard. Present, I'm sorry, present. Andrea Jepson. Present. <coughs> Kimberly McKnight. Present. Dr. Raquel Ingram. Present. Dr. LaDonna Thomas. Present. Dr. Laura Bartlett. Present. Chester Farley. Present. Tom Minowitz. Present. Lori Lewis. Present. Dr. Amy Steele. Present. Diane Layden. Present. Madam Chair, we have a quorum for this meeting. Thank you, Chandra. Should there be discussion or questions from board members during the conference call, please identify yourself by name prior to addressing the board. And now we'll go over the ethics awareness and conflict of interest reminder. In accordance with the State Ethics Act and Code of Conduct for members of the North Carolina Board of Nursing, it is the duty of every member to avoid both conflicts of interest and appearances of conflict. Does any member have any known conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before the board today? If so, please identify the conflict or appearance of conflict and refrain from any undue participation in that particular matter involved. First of all, I'd like to welcome all board members. We had hoped we would be in person together today, but uh, we're virtual once again, except for just a few of us. And I'd like to give a special welcome to our newly elected members who will take the oath of office in January 2022. Dr. Shakira Henderson, the at-large position, and Cheryl Wheeler, LPN. Are both of you here? I can't see you if you are, but sincere welcome and congratulations to both of you. I want to also welcome our guests who are with us on the virtual meeting today. The board's, the board's mission, vision, and values drive our work as a board and serve as a reminder to us as we carry out our business. The mission, vision, and values are posted on the board's website for reference during this teleconference meeting. Are there any other announcements at this time? Okay, the first item then is to um, review the agenda. Uh, M5, adoption of the consent agenda. Are there any modifications to the consent agenda? And if there are, remember to speak up and state your name. Okay. Do I have a motion regarding adoption of the consent agenda? It's Kimberly, I so move that we adopt the minutes and the agenda. Thank you. Kimberly McKnight has made a motion to adopt the consent agenda. Do I have a second? This is Andrea, I'll second it. Thank you, we have a second. All in favor? Oh, we, uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna call the vote. I'm gonna read it. Then I won't have to see all the hands. When your name is called, please respond to prove if you're in favor of the motion or opposed if you're not in favor of the motion. Dr. Ann Marie Milner. Approve. Arlene Imes. Approve. Lynetta Howard. Approved. Andrea Jepson. Approved. Kimberly McKnight. Approved. Dr. Raquel Ingram. Approved. Dr. LaDonna Thomas. Approved. Dr. Laura Bartlett. Approved. Chester Farley. Approved. Tom Minowitz. Approved. 
Lori Lewis. Approved. Dr. Amy Steele. Approved. Diane Layden. Approved. And Pam Edwards approved. Motion carries. And now for our meeting agenda today, are there any modifications that anyone would like to bring forward? If so, please identify yourself and the modifications. If not, do I have a motion regarding the adoption of the meeting agenda for today? Lori Lewis, I move that we adopt the agenda for today's meeting. Thank you, Lori. Lori Lewis has made the motion to adopt the meeting agenda. Do I have a second? This is Lynetta this Howard. This is Diana. I think I heard Lynetta first. Thank you, Lynetta. Uh, she has seconded the motion. We'll now call for the vote. And again, when your name is called, please respond approve if you're in favor of the motion or opposed if you're not in favor of the motion. Dr. Anne Marie Milner. Approve. Arlene Imes. Approve. Lynetta Howard. Approve. Andrea Jepson. Approved. Kimberly McKnight. Approved. Dr. Raquel Ingram. Approved. Dr. LaDonna Thomas. Approved. Dr. Laura Bartlett. Approved. Chester Farley. Approve. Tom Minowitz. Approve. Lori Lewis. Approve. Dr. Amy Steele. Approved. Diane Layden. Approved. And Pam Edwards approved. The motion carries and we have our meeting agenda to move forward. Uh, M7 is our next item and that is election of officers. The slate of candidates for the North Carolina Board of Nursing Chair and Vice Chair positions for 2022 include the following. Chair, Dr. Anne Marie Milner, RN, and Vice Chair, Arlene Imes, LPN. Are there any additional nominations from the floor? And again, if there are nominations, please uh, unmute and identify yourself. Okay, I don't hear any additional nominations. Do I have a motion to accept the slate of candidates for chair and vice chair as presented in agenda item M7 and elect Anne Marie Milner, chair, and Arlene Imes, vice chair, by acclamation? This is Diane. I so move. Thank you, Diane. Diane Layden has made a motion to accept the slate of candidates as presented. Do I have a second? This is Lagana. I second. Thank you. We have seconded the motion. We will now call for the vote. When your name is called, please respond approve if you're in favor of the motion or opposed if you're not in favor of the motion. Dr. Anne Marie Milner. Approve. Arlene Imes. Approve. Lynetta Howard. Approve. Andrea Jepson. Approved. Kimberly McKnight. Approved. Dr. Raquel Ingram. Approved. Dr. LaDonna Thomas. Approved. Dr. Laura Bartlett. Approved. Chester Farley. Approve. Tom Minowitz. Approve. Lori Lewis. Uh, Approved. I'm <clears throat> sorry. Dr. Amy Steele. Approved. Diane Layden. Approved. And Pam Edwards approved. So we now have our 2022 chair and vice chair. And I'd like to allow each candidate to give a few remarks. Very excited for both of you. Um, you'll each have uh, three minutes to uh, just address the board in any way that you choose. Um, first, uh, Dr. Anne Marie Milner, our incoming chair. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. I have very big shoes to fill. <laughs> I'm Pam to Martha, so I will do my best um, to carry on the tradition and safe practice and education standards. I am honored, honored to be the chair. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. You're most welcome. Arlene Imes, our new vice chair. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. You just don't know how much this means to me. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll continue mentoring, uh, coaching, um, any way that I can serve the committees, um, any processes, I'm here. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, congratulations to both of you. I, I don't think there could be a better uh, combination and we're all thrilled to have you as our new chair and co-chair. Uh, the next item, we'll skip M9 because we have our chair and vice chair and we'll go to finance committee, M10. And I would like to recognize um, committee member, Dr. Anne-Marie Milner and recognize staff liaison, Gail Bellamy. Thank you. Um, the recognized members of the finance chair are Dr. Pam Edwards, Chester Farley, Tom Minowitz, and Dr. Crystal Tillman. The finance committee met on August 11, 2021, and we um, went over the agenda. The summary of our activities was the fourth quarter financial statement. The board maintained a strong financial position through the fourth quarter of the uh, fiscal year with no negative impact on financial operations related to the pandemic. The committee reviewed the following financial statements, the statement of net position, the statement of revenue expenditures and changes in net position. The statement of net position summarizes the financial position as of 6-30-2021. The net position increased by 2.46 million for the fiscal year. Assets totaled over 26.7 million. Liability totaled approximately 9.6 million, resulting in a net position of over 17.1 million. The following performances are results are relevant to the NCBON operations. The operating reserve increased 16.8% over the last year and is equivalent to 13.87 months of operations. The target of the performance is six months of operating reserve. Debt to ratio reflects the NCBON's ability to cover its debt and it's equivalent to 35.9%. The target ratio is less than 50% of debt to assets. Liquid ratio shows NCBON's ability to pay its short-term obligations and it's equivalent to a ratio of 4.23 23 to one. The target ratio is a two to one, twice the amount of cash and investments as current liabilities. The investment objective to achieve um, a target rate of 3% growth portfolio performance is up to 4.45% as of July 31st, 2021. The statement of revenue exp expenditures and changes in net position shows detail of how financial position changed during the year. The revenue operating and non-operating revenue totaled approximately 12.3 million and increased by 1.3 million over the 12.2% over the same period of last year. Expenditures totaled 9.8 million, an increase of 84,213 or 80.86% over the same period last year. And then review of investments. Um, we're going to recognize Wes Thomas and the team from the Wells Fargo's advisors to prevent the market analysis investments performance report. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, yes this, this is Gail speaking and I'd like to uh, before uh, the investment team comes on address uh, Tom's question. OK, great. Uh, and thank you very much for your very sharp eye. That number is actually incorrect. The market value as of June 30 is actually 19 million 167,776. That probably matches more with the fiscal statement. Thank you very much for catching that. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Tom, for picking that up. Okay. Do we do we want to move on to the investments? Um, Wes, Wes Thomas and his team is, are they on? Yes, we are on. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Great. Yes, go okay. ahead. Well, thanks for having us. 
um, I believe we've got a, a strong report to, to provide this morning. Uh, Jessica Christie, my teammate, is going to cover the performance and then I will pick up with just a brief market update. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica. Okay. Well, can everyone hear me as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, well, yes, good morning. Um, thank you for having us today. Uh, so I will just start with uh, a, a market or a, a review of the performance. So looking at the board's account, uh, the board's accounts at Wells Fargo Advisors um, currently 34% uh, makes up the stock portion of the account uh, and 66% makes up the bond portion. Uh, I just note that um, we, we are keeping a close eye on that. Um, the, we, we understand the board's maximum in stock uh, can be 35%, so we are keeping an eye on that to make sure that that stays in the range. But that is where it is currently with stocks doing so well. Um, the performance, when we look at the stock account, the performance, these numbers are as of the end of July. Uh, the stock account was up 14.28% through the end of July. And the bond account was flat. Um, it was really up 0 0.02, um, so we just consider that flat through the end of July. So the total portfolio through the end of July was up 4.45%. When we look at comparisons, uh, S&P 500 was up 18% uh, through, through the end of July, and the Dow was up 15.3%. When we look at a, a, an accurate representation, a more accurate blended index for how the board's stock account uh, is, is allocated, that index was up right around 15.3% as well. Uh, so the board um, is doing well there in that stock account performance. Uh, the U.S. aggregate bond index was, was down slightly through the end of July. It was down 0.5%. Uh, so the board is outperforming that bond at that index through the end of July as well. I did take a look this morning to see how the board's accounts were doing through the, the close of business yesterday, and they're almost exactly the same. They're very, very similar. Uh, stock account is up just a, just a little bit more, 14.6 um, instead of 14.28. But overall doing well this year, and I will turn it over to us. Okay, so Wells Fargo uh, Investment Institute continues to believe that we will have a multi-year economic recovery. And I think it's a good time to, to, to um, think about that because there is so much in the news today and it's such an anxious time for everyone uh, with, the, with the Delta surge that we're experiencing. Um, we do think that the U.S. GDP, uh, U.S. economic growth will grow um, slightly over 6% for 2021, which would make it the, the highest GDP growth year since 1984. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, we think this will be a multi-year multi, multi -year recovery. So we believe 2022, um, the GDP growth will be uh, just over 5%. So it'll moderate some, uh, but still a significant growth year next year. Um, the reason we believe that we will experience the economic recovery is because the consumer has remained very, very strong. We've seen a very robust recovery in the consumer, a lot of pent-up demand. Um, the Federal Reserve has remained very supportive to the markets. We have super low interest rates, massive stimulus, and there's been a lot of inventory, uh, or there will be a lot of inventory rebuilding that will that we think will will last and persist well into to 2022, um, uh, because there's been such strong consumer demand. So we've also revised our market forecast uh, upward. Uh, because earnings for corporations have been even stronger than anticipated this year, and we think that will carry into next year. So our forecast 
uh, for the S&P 500 is actually about 11% higher than where we are today through the end of 2022. Uh, so we, we do have a, 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 a strong forecast. Um, we believe that interest rates will, will gradually rise um, over the next several years, um, and but we do think this would be a slow rise in interest rates and a gradual rise in interest rates, which should prove to be good for stocks uh, uh, since it would keep borrowing corporate borrowing costs low and uh, and leave no other alternatives for for strong long-term growth rates other than investing in stocks. So we know that there's some concerns out there. Um, you guys are seeing it with inflation and the Delta surge, and I just want to touch on those and then I'll close. So with inflation, um, inflation is running high. We, we have in, in expected it to be high this year and, and think that will continue into next year. Um, it will run high for several years, but should moderate some next year as the GDP, as, as economic growth moderates, uh, we think the inflation pressure should moderate some as well. Um, and the thing we all need to remember about with inflation is stocks are, are historically have been the best hedge against inflation pressures. The next thing I want to touch on is Delta, and this is very concerning for investors, and it's stressful for everyone. <laughs> you know, I think I think it's, it's affected us all, um, and touched us, and made it to be a stressful time. But the economic damage will likely be contained. We think at this point, um, we we. We need to remind ourselves that the markets are always looking out six to 12 months down the road, perhaps even longer down the road. And so the financial markets likely are looking out well beyond the surge with Delta. Um, <clears throat> when we look overseas at the United Kingdom and, and India that have, that have uh, already dealt with uh, the Delta uh, or Deal, still dealing with, I'm sure, but have, have seen the peak pass. Um, the, there was a sharp rise followed by a sharp decline in India, a sharp rise followed by a significant decline in the U United Kingdom. And so we need to need to keep that in mind and that the markets are always looking forward and, and likely looking uh, well beyond the Delta virus, the Delta surge. I would summarize and just saying we believe there'll be strong economic growth, um, economic growth over a multi-year period that is nearly three times the, the historical growth rate of the economy. Um, so we want to be positioned to participate in that economic growth. Um, that's the reason why we have our stock exposure near the limit uh, of the policy statement um, and um, would encourage, you know, and encourage y'all to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> you know, we do need the, the bond exposure for the safety and liquidity that, that the bonds provide. Um, so I think we have a nice balance allocation and we are positioned for the forecast that, that we believe and have conviction in at Wells Fargo Advisors. So I will pause there and see if we have any questions. Um, but before I do that, I just want to thank everyone for, for, for allowing us to participate today. Thank you, Wes. We certainly enjoy seeing our Wells Fargo colleagues in person, but you've done a great job um, on the phone with this piece of our agenda. So thank you. Board members, uh, it's now the time to ask questions. Um, again, unmute and identify yourself if you have questions for Dr. Milner, Dale Bellamy, or uh, our Wells Fargo colleagues. Any questions or discussion? Okay, 
doesn't look like there are. Thank you uh, to both of you. Um, Anne Marie, are, are you going to um, make the motion uh, around designation of funds? Yes. Yes. Um, so I would like to make a motion for the following of designation of funds. Um, our recommended the recommendation from the Finance Committee is that the board designate 822,553 of unrestricted net assets for future funding needs as reported. Thank you, uh, Dr. Milner. This is a committee recommendation, and so we do not need a second. We'll now call for the vote. When your name is called, please respond to proof if you're in favor of the motion or opposed if you're not in favor. Dr. Anne Marie Milner? Approved. Arlene Imes? Approved. Lynetta Howard? Approved. Andrea Jepson? Approved. Kimberly McKnight? Approved. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Dr. Raquel Ingram? Approved. Dr. LaDonna Thomas? Approved. Dr. Laura Bartlett? Approved. Chester Farley? Approved. Tom Minowitz. Approved. Lori Lewis. Approved. Dr. Amy Steele. Approved. Diane Layden. Approved. And Pam Edwards, I approve, so the motion carries. And now I'd like to recognize our Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Crystal Tillman. Great, thank you, Dr. Edwards. Um, I too would like to recognize and congratulate our two board members, uh, Dr. Shakira Henderson, who is our RN at large, and also Cheryl Wheeler for our LPN seat. And uh, they will have the same term as our strategic plan. So they'll start in January 2022 and then go through to December of 2025. You know, the board was very pleased this year with the number of candidates. It's always nice to see the nursing profession come out. And for the RN at large position this year, we had 20 candidates, which is amazing. And then for the LPNC, we had six candidates. So very proud of that. Voting was a little bit lower this year, but we really feel like it was the pandemic, the nursing shortage, we're all busy right now. Um, so hopefully over the next year, our voting numbers will improve. And now I would like to recognize our new staff employees. It's always nice to bring young, younger talent and new innovative ideas into the organization. So I would like to ask each one of you just to uh, turn on your video just for a second, just so board members can get a name and face together. So first is our new investigator. Uh, she is a nurse, Christina Deaver. And Christina, if you can turn on your camera so we can meet you. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Oh, there you are. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. And uh, I know that uh, the Director of Investigations, Angie Mathis, is delighted to have you on board. Next is Stacy Thompson, is our new practice consultant, <laughs> also a nurse. And Stacy, if you can come on. For come on. Good morning, good morning. And I will tell you the Director of Practice, Joyce Winstead, is delighted to have you as well. So welcome. Then our new and third attorney is Rob Patchett. Is, and you'll be seeing a lot of Rob. Good morning. Our investigations. Uh, Rob, are you able to turn on your camera? I hope so. Okay, good, good. Is it on? I, we don't see you, but uh, we hear you, so that's good. <laughs> Welcome. Yes. And uh, it's interesting that all three of our attorneys, we've got some great law schools here in this area. All three of our attorneys have gone to Campbell University. So it says something great about the Campbell University Law School, I think. And then finally, uh, someone that you're all going to get to know very well is our new receptionist, Denise Howie. 
And Denise. Just met her outside. I started to say, line. yes, yes. You will really enjoy working with uh, Denise. And uh, she's originally from Belize. Um, so it's nice to learn a different culture. So welcome to all our new staff and we're uh, happy to have you on board. So that brings us up to 51 board staff right now after our 20-25% of turnover with our oh. retirements. Um, I will say that Melissa McDonald, our Chief of Human Resources, has been working extremely hard and been organized and doing all the interviews for all these positions. So thank you, Melissa. Um, we are doing three final interviews next week in person. And hopefully at that point, we will have all of our positions filled. So we're doing our first interview virtually, and then our second interviews are, are done in person where we can spread out in the boardroom. And also we have another retirement, um, Amy Wilson in licensure. She's been with the board for 18 years. Today is her last day. So uh, Amy, we wish you well, stay safe. Amy, you were one of the early adopters in, in getting the COVID vaccine, so thank you for leading us in that. So we will miss you and best of luck to you. I would like to congratulate um, our finance team, man, they're great. Gail Bellamy, Emma Palmer, we, they just had an excellent, very clean uh, annual audit report. And I tell you, the auditors love working with Gail and Hema. It makes their life easier. So thank you all for that. And the Finance Committee appreciates it as well. I'd also like to congratulate Catherine Moore and Julie George, our former CEO. They published a chapter uh, in a book that was released August 31st. It's called Health Policy and Politics, A Nurse's Guide. So it's great to have them uh, co-authoring the uh, nursing regulatory chapter. On Amazon? Uh, it should be on Amazon. Catherine, I know you're going to be speaking later. Is, uh, is it on Amazon currently? It should be since it was released in yes, August. I, I, I believe it was, they delayed it to September 3rd for the release, but it should be available on Amazon now. On we don't want autographs, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. Congratulations. And I'd also like to recognize Meredith Paris. She ran a great campaign for the Area 3 Leadership, Leadership Succession Committee at National Council. So thank you for representing the North Carolina Board. You did so well. And I also wanted to mention that uh, I have now been appointed to be the new chair for the NCLEX Examination Committee at National Council. So I am looking forward to working with Phil Dickinson and his team at National Council uh, for the next four years and uh, being able to chair this committee. I've actually served on this committee for six years, so um, made a lot of friends from different states. So it is uh, wonderful that I'm looking forward to being able to chair that committee. That's quite an honor, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. And it will occur um, when the new NGN comes out, the next generation NCLEX that you've been hearing about. So it's going to be released in April of 2023. So it will be nice to take it to delicate assembly and uh, to, to get it passed. So I'm very excited about that. And of course, you're going to hear more about the NGN over the the next few months um, and so we're we're looking forward to bringing that and and really being able to measure nursing students their clinical judgment we'll be able to measure that piece now um, so excited about that you know our goal you know with the pandemic and certainly in licensure um, you know we have a, a rule of thumb that an in, in uninterrupted pipeline of nurses with no barriers to licensure is our goal. And um, that's what we've been able to do during this pandemic. And we're very proud of that. Um, we now have no delays in the NCLEX testing at the Pearson View sites in North Carolina. I would say that the barrier right now is really with the SBI and doing the criminal background checks. 
they're about four weeks behind in getting the CBCs approved. But I'm very happy to announce that we are getting nurses to the pipeline as quickly as possible. The COVID waivers, they um, will be up December 31st of this year with the way things are going. Who knows, Amy and I might be working on them and uh, delaying it. Certainly, uh, we want to work with uh, nurses and uh, hospital acute care agencies um, to make sure that the waivers are in place. So uh, we will keep you informed of that. Um, some of you may have heard about last week, the American Nurses Association, they called for DHHS to declare a national nursing staffing crisis. So we will certainly continue to monitor that and let you know. You know, in North Carolina, we're also facing a nursing shortage and especially in the clinical arenas and, and in this area. I don't think right now there's a hospital in North Carolina that isn't experiencing a shortage. Um, so it's perfect timing today to have Dr. Freyer from the Shep Center and her team talk about the workforce study. So really looking forward to that presentation. Now saying that we have a nursing shortage, I will tell you our licensure numbers have gone up. So about six months ago, we were at about 164,000 licensed nurses. Do you know that we're now up to 170,000 licensed nurses in North Carolina in just that six month time? We've had a 21% increase in endorsement. So it means that people are moving, nurses are moving to North Carolina. It's an attractive state, um, certainly with Apple coming and uh, all the industry we have here, um, certainly makes North Carolina attractive. So I would like to give a little update about our IT. I tell you, cybersecurity is certainly a key uh, in, our pro in our priorities. Um, so I wanted to let everybody know that uh, Microsoft Office 365, everyone, board staff, board members and board staff will be getting a new E5 license, which this is going to provide a higher level of security and this is going to be between October 4th and 8th that you will receive an email in order to um, update to a E5 license. You'll also have conditional access and will have the ability to do a two-factor authentication if Surya detects risky behavior. Um, an example, you know, Surya is always on top of things. Um, our, our chief, uh, Angela um, Ellis, got contacted by Surya last week and said, uh, Angela, we just need to know, have you been in Vietnam uh, the past two days because someone has tried to get into your email from Vietnam? And Angela assured them that she was not traveling nor was in Vietnam. So um, we're happy that Surya is very um, on the ball and certainly protecting our data but we always have to stay one step ahead with all the data that we uh, certainly provide and all the private information. So conditional access that I mentioned that we'll have, conditional access means that you will be able to access if it's a board issued device or an approved device. So for instance, if I have my laptop here, it's a board device, I will be able to um, get in and, and on uh, the SharePoint where I need to get information. If I'm using a personal device like my iPad, then no, unless it's been approved by the board. And that's simply um, for security reasons. By the end of the year, our calls will be in the cloud. They will now be on Teams. Um, that's exciting. You know, our desk phones will be a thing of the past pretty soon. Uh, 3CX, our current phone system, will be history, and we will be able to use our teams um, much more. So really looking forward to that. Our new website design, not only are we doing a new design, but we're going to be on a new platform as well. And that's going to take us about 10 months um, to get our new website out. And by the end of the summer, 2022 is when we're expecting that to be completed. 
And now I'd like to ask for Brad, if you could share a PowerPoint slide that um, our Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, they have worked very hard. Staff have been involved in voting for a logo, uh, in crafting the mission, and I'm very proud of this. Our mission at the North Carolina Board of Nursing is to protect the public through regulating the practice of nursing. To support this mission, the board is committed to providing an inclusive, innovative workplace for all employees, reflective of the diverse cultures and backgrounds of the public. And we voted on the logos. We had about four, so um, the staff like this one the best. So we're very pleased with that. Our policy should be coming out next week uh, that we'll be able to review. So. Thank you for all board staff who worked so hard on that. Okay, and Brad, you can take that down now. Thank you. And I would also like to, you know, we have a lot of things going on, our daily work, certainly the website and all, but right now our organizational priorities, there's two. The first one is, of course, the strategic plan. Board staff have been working really hard. We've divided into six teams with each one of the chiefs, and they've been collecting data, doing some of the analysis. So when all of us are able to meet, uh, October 21st will be um, our retreat date, that we will have the information we need to move forward with um, drafting a strategic <laughs> plan. So Susan Meyer from Board Source, who you've all met, she will be with us in Greensboro to facilitate that discussion. This strategic plan is going to be our roadmap from 2022 to 2025. So look forward to that time together. At this point, we are still planning to meet in person. Susan Meyer is flying in. We will just socially distance and um, have our meals outside. The second thing is our quality improvement project. Board staff had um, a big input on this. And what should this year, what should really be our quality improvement project? And we decided it really should be policies and procedures updating because it really has been quite a while since we have reviewed. So Roger Burns will be taking the lead um, on the quality project. Amy Fitzhugh and myself will also uh, be reviewing the policies and the board departments. Uh, certainly they will be mapping out their processes. We would like for someone who is in practice to be able to, if needed, look at a procedure and say, okay, these are the steps in education for approving a nursing program. So it's very clear. So we look forward to that. Um, big news that happened last week in uh, North Carolina Nurses Association or Nursing Advocacy, um, the SAVE Act. Uh, last week, if you look under your additional documents uh, in your board packet, you'll see in the list of items. Um, last week, uh, North Carolina Nurses Association announced really a huge advan advancement um, with the SAVE Act. And that was the endorsement of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, which is, is fantastic to have that much support from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Now, I will tell you that Blue Cross and Blue Shield released it to the legislators first. Um, so kind of the cat was out of the bag. Um, the next day, the North Carolina Medical Society, they did have a little pushback and some concerns. And, some of them reached out to their legislators or to the medical society, but uh, I think we have uh, a good uh, shot, hopefully, uh, Tina Gordon and her team of, of moving this forward. So um, it's certainly needed and uh, um, for public safety as well to have nurse practitioners and all APRNs being able to work at the full scope of the practice. So two things coming about the meeting agenda that you're getting ready to hear. Um, last month, National Council, they had their annual meeting that some of you observed, and uh, the new model act and rules were approved. So because of this, education rules are a huge part of it. And you, you're going to get a request to extend <laughs> the education and committee charge so the team has longer time 
to really incorporate the education rules from model uh, act and rules that uh, we can use uh, for our board's benefit. So that will be one thing. Another thing that will be coming up um, on the agenda is item M18. Dr. Ward will present an alternate pathway for Northeastern University. This is a new innovative uh, pathway for North Carolina. I will tell you at this time, there's no precedence of this pathway for North Carolina, nor for any other board uh, in the United States. Uh, Northeastern University is located, the um, home campus is in Boston, and their satellite office is in Charlotte, right downtown. Um, they do not have a pathway um, like this at their Boston location as to date. So it will be a new pathway for uh, nursing as well. So um, Dr. Ward will be presenting that later. And next, I would like to hand it over to Roger Burns so he can discuss our strategic plan update and our performance measures scorecard. And then uh, Catherine Moore, we will pass it to uh, Dr. Catherine Moore, we will pass uh, to you to give our legislative update. And finally, uh, Dr. Erin Freyer and her team will uh, present for the SHEP Center on the North Carolina nursing workforce data. So Roger, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time. I uh, hope you can see and or hear me. I'm gonna be presenting this portion here on our progress on our current strategic plan. My goal today is to do two things. The first thing is to introduce you to a new platform we're using called Achieve It and a relationship with a vendor that we've engaged for uh, relaying strategic initiative uh, information to the board members and to staff, as well as to give a brief overview of the strategic plan. While I still love reading to my children, I will not be reading the strategic plan to you verbatim. I will re rely on you to, to uh, pick and choose what, what tickles your fancy later. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you have an opportunity to see um, what I do. All right, can everyone, let me see. Uh, Crystal, since since I can see and hear you, would you mind just confirming that you can see the strategic plan? Yes, it looks great, Roger. Great, thank you. All right, so we've engaged with a new vendor called Achieve It to uh, track and relay information regarding our strategic plan. The format of the strategic plan in this current uh, board packet should be relatively familiar to you, except for the addition of this aggregate information along the top of it. The goal with this, uh, with partnering with Achieve It, is to bring an increased level of transparency and tracking for strategic initiatives, objectives, and measures. We hope that by doing this and presenting uh, information in new and novel ways that will be help painting a better picture and narrative for the progress that we're making over time and during the strategic planning periods to engage the board members in what we've done, what we're hoping to do, uh, and what may be falling behind. So to that, I wanna go ahead and grab your attention and look at this pie chart here. We can see that we're 20, uh, 20 items are currently on track, 10 are off, 10 are at risk. We've achieved 16, one will not be achieved during this strategic planning period, and one has been canceled. We feel that this is a useful set of tools for you to understand how we're making progress. And for a brief synopsis, the items that are currently off track or at risk, for the most part, are due to uh, COVID during 2020. And the time that we spent in adjusting the workforce here and the board to deal with you know, the change from in-person to virtual work, et cetera. A large portion of those are actually related to policy and procedure updates that we were hoping to do incrementally at that time. And as you've heard Crystal allude to, we're going to be continuing that as a quality project, continuing into the next strategic planning period. The items that we have achieved, of course, are testaments to the proficiency uh, and hard work at the board. And we continue to be working on other items through the remainder of this strategic planning period to the rest of 2021. The one item that was not achieved is an internal uh, objective that was identified by staff in using in our case management system. So no, uh, nothing that can't be done and revisited at a later date. Uh, so if there are any follow-up questions or anything that uh, you would like reviewed, I would suggest that you maybe touch base afterwards, uh, something that we can uh, give a handoff to the relative staff members and chiefs to address, and uh, we can go from there. 
we're looking forward a lot to working with Achieve It and changing how this report is is related to you, making sure that you have a, a better understanding of of the work that we're doing, the progress we're making, and doing it in a way that's showing you more data, opposed to just uh, verbal or even written updates on individual measures. So we're, we're very much looking forward to this. Uh, let's see, I think that is it this time for the strategic plan overview and this aggregate of what's going on here at the board. We're excited to continue doing this and are looking forward to the completion of the, the next uh, strategic plan period. Uh, at this time, I think I believe it's time to pass it on to Catherine. Roger, I believe that Crystal mentioned um, that you were going to to continue with the performance measures scorecard before I did my legislative update. Apologies, I I can I can most definitely do that. All right, one moment. Okay. <clears throat> So as alluded to by Crystal, we're going to be we'll be looking at some of the same style of information as what you would have seen last year at this time. The performance scorecard has been kept in the same format with the same kind of data to give continuity. One of the things that we'll be looking forward to as we continue to look at the workforce studies and how we present this information will be how this scorecard needs to change in its appearance and in its uh, uh, the narrative that it's driving for you so that you can derive the appropriate um, assessments on the environment, whether internally or externally, about our uh, performance either as a board or the environment of the, the nursing uh, workforce around us. As you can see, and what Crystal alluded to earlier, is an overall increase in the number of licensees uh, opposed to previous year. Despite the reduction in LPNs, especially in 2020, we we're seeing that number begin to climb back up uh, in, this, in this past fiscal year, and most other licenses saw similar increases. We did see a slight reduction in CNSs, though don't let the visual fool you. I believe the reduction was only by three. We're still seeing the same relative breakdown year over year between the different license types, and no anticipation of that changing significantly going forward. In terms of demographics, we are seeing the same sort of distribution of nurses based on where they're living around city centers. No real changes there. Of course, we are seeing 25% uh, uh, 20 of our active licensees are baby boomers or older. Licensees remain predominantly female with over 70% identifying as Caucasian. 21% were licensed before 1995 with 46% licensed since 2010. Those entering the profession via exam remains relatively unfazed by COVID. Uh, we do know that last year we saw uh, measures taken by Pearson View to accommodate testing requirements and accommodations. However, the overall submission levels, and despite looking uh, a bit more spread out this year, remain consistent. Uh, interestingly, and not depicted here, the processing of exam applications during COVID followed roughly the same pattern as previous years, with the majority of exam applications of spring graduates having been processed by the middle of October, uh, which I think is an excellent, excellent testament to not only the organizations, but the environment's response to COVID and getting nurses in, uh, you know, tested and then approved for licensure. The uh, pass rate trends continue and are uh, still higher than the national average. And as you heard Crystal mention, endorsements are still strong. We're seeing uh, uh, nurses coming in from all major states and the uh, breakdown by license type uh, is still consistent with other licensure trends that we're seeing. I do want to address the dip in what you're seeing in terms of applications being submitted for endorsement towards the end of the fis this fiscal year for 2021. In rerunning the numbers uh, several, uh, two months after this initial report was generated, this uh, dip was erased and we're seeing normal trends for May and June of 2021 as what we would expect to see in previous years. So far, the only dips we typically see as periodic are still around the winter holidays of Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas and New Year's. 
Corporations and PLLCs remain constant and steady. The dip uh, in applications for new corporations and LLCs will be an interesting trend to watch over the next year, especially with this impact to small businesses that we've seen during COVID. Its submission remains steady. <clears throat> Uh, with the majority continuing to be public, with only 53% of complaints in fiscal year 2021 resulted in a case being opened. The breakdown by license type and other uh, uh, information regarding complaints is also consistent as well. Our investigations are still uh, impressive. We're seeing a large portion of our cycle times being done within 180 days. We're seeing a steady uh, uh, pace on investigations that are being closed by quarter uh, and the the gain that we made and peak the, during COVID that allowed us to close additional cases is closing, uh, reducing slightly, though we'll be curious to see how this progresses towards the end of this year. As you can see, the largest investigation outcomes remain to be letter of concerns and legal insufficiencies. Regarding legal proceedings, we're still seeing the large uh, majority going to hearing and settlement. Of those, the final actions still remain suspensions and reprimand with conditions. License types in these areas continue to follow the overall licensing patterns uh, of our active license population. In terms of compliance, we're seeing a relatively steady entering and exiting of participants. Regarding those who are exiting, we're seeing the top 75%, uh, the four, top four categories regarding the uh, alternative program, courses, and CDDP. Now, those who are entering, however, the top four has shifted slightly to include probationary non-screeners. That's it for our scorecard this year. Uh, and again, one of the things we'll be looking for in the next couple of scorecards and reporting periods will be how do we continue to use our data, change what we're, uh, how we're presenting it, and to give you a better narrative about the environments, whether that's internally and how we're performing, or what the external environment looks like and how we can use data to make data-driven decisions. Uh, please, if any questions come up over time, do not hesitate to send them in so that we can address them and, and look forward to uh, continuing to serve the board and your reporting needs. Thank you. Now, Dr. Catherine Moore is going to give us a legislative update. You're on mute, Catherine. My apologies. Um, thank you, Dr. Tillman and board members for this <coughs> opportunity to just share a, a brief update. Um, the North Carolina General Assembly began its long session in January, and it has indeed been a long session and continues to be a long session. I you know, believe that gone are the days when we see the long session ending in the summer. It's trickled in. We're in September now. and. My understanding is the latest estimates of when they will, um, they're anticipating getting a budget passed that can be signed into law is probably mid-October. So that process is kind of intermingled now with their redistricting meetings. Um, Dr. Tillman already presented the most exciting nursing related news um, right now with the Blue Cross Blue Shield letter um, it, to the bill sponsors in support of the SAVE Act. I think that it's important to highlight kind of just the momentum that has been building um, in July. Dr. Tillman was one of 18 speakers um, at a stakeholder meeting that was convened by those bill sponsors to kind of get a broader stakeholder understanding of support and opposition to the bill. And they use that momentum really for some of their additional behind the scenes conversations, um, which has led to that Blue Cross Blue Shield letter. Um, additionally, that letter was followed the same day by one of support from the North Carolina Association of Health Plans. And so again, there's continuing momentum and I think the bill sponsors are really excited to see this movement. And you know, we're they're really cautiously optimistic that 
that there might actually be success this session. Um, recent discussions have included thoughts that that legislation could be part of a health care package that's part of the budget or even a, a separate health care omnibus package, but um, that will be continued and um, we will just continue to watch that closely in the in the next several weeks. Um, so I promise not to go line by line. Um, my my written report was item M14 in your board packet, but I do want to highlight just one of the session laws and then a few of the, the select bills noted <coughs> in there just to give you an idea of the kinds of bills that we monitor um, as an occupational licensing board for, for anything that may impact us specifically. Um, the first one is um, session law um, 2021-90, which is with Senate Bill 126, entitled Clean Up Obsolete Boards. Now that included a section that would allow the co-chair to allow the co-chairs of the Joint Legislative Commission on Governmental Operations to create subcommittees um, to inquire into any matters properly before the commission. Um, that became effective July 1st, 2021. And just something to note, um, I believe that those subcommittees will be doing the, the work and the studies that previously the, the nonpartisan program evaluation conducted. Um, recall that earlier this session, the PED, as it was known, was dissolved by the legislature. And so now it, it, the legislators are going to have more, more committee type work looking into some of those issues so that we will continue, as we always have, to monitor the work of that, um, of that entity within the legislature. Um, next is um, House Bill 434. Um, this this bill um, is not um, active currently. In June, I think it was June 29th. Um, that bill started. Well, let me back up. That bill started off as a um, Reflexology Regulation Act bill, and then in June the um, Regulatory Reform Committee did one of their um, maneuvers, like a gut and stuff maneuver, where they completely replaced the old language with the new language. And this would have created um, the new language would have created a health, a healing arts commission. Um, and during the presentation of that change, Dr. or um, excuse me, Representative Rydell mentioned that this could be a regulatory entity that could oversee um, occupations and professions that don't have large enough numbers to require oversight by a board. Um, the, this language included reflexologists and massage therapists in it. Um, I think it's important for us to remain aware of any type of bills that create healing arts commissions. There are other states, um, for example, Kansas, that has, I believe, a board of healing arts. And that is one where I believe the FTC weighed in because they were trying to bring regulation of APRNs underneath that Board of Healing Arts. And again, the, the conflict that exists there when you have oversight of one occupation by another. So that's why we're just continuing to watch that. That bill has um, was referred to House Health and it hasn't gone anywhere and it's unlikely that that will happen. Um, in a similar light, um, and I've had great conversations with our board member, Diane Layden, regarding this issue and the reflexologists, they actually had other language inserting into House Bill 911, which is the Regulatory Reform 2.0 bill noted in your um, in your document. And um, they are trying to get regulation of reflexology out from under the Board of Massage and Body Work. There was, Diane, you may need to correct me on this, Massage and Body Work Therapy Board. Um, and there were concerns raised about this with um, the uh, with Senator Crawick um, and the impact this could have on the potential for human trafficking. And so, again, we monitor any bills related to regulatory reform. The Massage and Body Work Therapy Board has really taken the initiative and, and talked to the legislators about the problems that could occur with regard to the, the reflexology language. So it's unlikely that those bills will have any further movement. Um, my, the next bill I wanted to talk about is House Bill 572. That's no vaccine mandate by executive order, rule, or agency. <clears throat> that would include provisions to prohibit state agencies from adopting rules that would <clears throat> mandate or require a person to receive a vaccination um, as part of their renewal receipt or reinstatement of a license. That has been a Senate rule since May, and we haven't seen any additional movement at this time. 
And then finally, I thought it would be it's important to highlight something from the national level. And on July 9th, President Biden um, issued an executive order um, on promoting competition in the American economy. And part of that executive order um, has um, uh, the creation of a White House Competition Council. And um, at the chair, council chair's discretion, the Federal Trade Commission is encouraged to exercise its authority in rulemaking um, in, on areas, including those related to unfair occupational licensing restrictions. And so in a similar light to our SAVE Act activity, our other lia um, legislative liaison and chief legal officer, Amy Fitzhugh, in her role with the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, has actually had conversations with the Federal Trade Commission lawyers, and they're aware of the SAVE Act activity in this state. And so, again, that's something from the federal level that could possibly have some trickle down effects at the state level re related to occupational licensure. So, um, Dr. Tillman, that's the conclusion of my verbal remarks, unless anyone has any questions for me. Okay, well, I will sign off and I believe um, it's time for our update and the great presentation from Dr. Aaron Frayer and the SHEPS team on the workforce research study. Good morning and thank you all for this invitation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you, Dr. Tillman. And thank you to the board for this invitation to share the latest on our results from our nursing workforce model. I do wish we were in person. Um, we're all getting quite tired of Zoom, but it is lovely seeing you all on video. Um, I wanted to take this moment at the risk of sounding obsequious um, to tell you how grateful I am about the funding. I'm sure that you have been watching the news. I'm sure that you've been hearing about nursing workforce shortages, about burnout, about concerns about staffing COVID. And when we began this work with you years ago, we could not have anticipated the pandemic. And yet, because of your forethought and your investment, we are able to produce a model, I would argue, at precisely the time the state needs it. So I just want to say thank you for that, um, because I think it's a really important time. Um, I keep saying it, it's a bit of dumb luck on our part, but it turns out to be quite strategic on yours. Um, I want to acknowledge also before I dive into our presentation, uh, the team. Um, I'm here with a team of people who, like you, have been working virtually for way too long. Uh, it's not been an easy time. We span two continents, uh, five time zones. We've had some staff turnover. Uh, we've had some COVID interruptions. Um, but this work has kept us grounded and, and we're excited about it. So we're really happy to be here with you today. I'm going to share my screen, but I'm going to ask, um, first of all, if you could please hold your question and answers until their end. There will be time for them, except in Andy Napton's time where he's going to be doing an interactive uh, uh, quiz with you. The Brits love quiz nights, so you're going to get a quiz morning here. So at that point, you can you can put things in the chat. But for now, I will ask that you hold your um, questions until the um, until the end. So I am going to share my screen and you're going to see a momentary uh, picture of my puppy. <laughs> um, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and I'm going to get over here. So here we are. Um, the, the plan for the next hour, we're going to give you a status update on where we are with things. Andy is going to give you that quiz with the demo so that you can both see the findings of the model, but also just sort of see how it works and how you interact with the model and you will when it's launched. Then Andy's going to turn it over to Evan Galloway, who's going to run through what we call our education visualization, which he will show you how you can track where program grads are going in the state. Then he's going to turn it back to me and I'm going to talk about dissemination plans and then we'll go into the Q&A. And of course, all of these handoffs will be seamless, I hope. <laughs> all right, project goals. Where are we? <clears throat> we promised you we would forecast the supply of registered nurses and licensed practical nurses in North Carolina. We have completed that. We uh, forecasted demand, which is always a challenge uh, of registered nurses and LPNs in North Carolina. Happy to share more information about that. 
you in fact have the documentation. Uh, I hope that if you have any feedback about the technical report, you will give it to us any places of confusion or question, um, but you have the underlying methodology. And then we brought that supply model together with that demand model and estimated shortages and surpluses at the state level for Medicaid regions and for AHEC regions. We then developed a set of scenarios to estimate the effect of various changes. You know, the nursing workforce is dynamic. There are changes all the time happening. So increase in supply of nurses, um, you know, the effect of the pandemic, increased competition uh, for, for nurses from other states. So we've rolled through those scenarios to try to come up with the what ifs because we know that we've projected a model based on the past, past trends. That's the way models work. The best data that you have project the future, but we know things can change and that's why the scenarios are really important. And one of the most rewarding parts of this project has been working with nursing expert stakeholders. I have been astounded by the level of engagement of chief nursing officers, of deans, of our North Carolina Public Health Department and others saying, yes, we wanna sniff check your results and help you uh, to be able to disseminate your results when it's time. So that engagement I think speaks very highly of what's gonna happen when we launch this model. One of the things that uh, our team very much believes in, we could have given you a report and it, you know, you could have turned the pages and seen it, but we believe in the power of data visualizations. And in fact, Evan Galloway is a national leader in developing these education visualizations or, and just data visualizations period. So we're building and have built a website where the model will sit. And you'll see a bit of that when Andy and Evan are running through their, um, their visualization demonstrations. And that is nearly complete. It's nearly complete because we're still gonna upload the documentation we shared with you and some other things. Um, and then Evan's gonna show you the data viz that he developed for the education uh, programmatic visualizations. And then I'm going to talk to you a bit at the end about our plans to dissemination, uh, to disseminate the results. You've probably seen that we've already been disseminating them a little bit, um, letting some of the information out there to build interest in the model. So we'll talk about that in more detail. But right now I am going to turn it over to my colleague uh, Andy and he will um, uh, be able to share uh, his um, quiz with you. Over to you, Andy. Fingers crossed. Um, can you see a nice picture of a um, of the sea? Rubbish, not in the sea, the uh, a river. We can. I, I, um, it's two rivers, and I forget the names, but they're in your continent, not mine. So I excuse myself. Okay, um, I am five hours ahead of you, so it's Friday afternoon here. Um, but it's still sunny for England, um, but um, it's a quiz. Um, for those introverts of you on a piece of paper, not too big, not too small, feel free to write it down. For the extroverts of you, click on the chat button and put your answer up in there or say nothing. I'll just keep going. Um, so um, let me, uh, you can see the screen, uh, the visualization screen, and this is still the demo, uh, demo development website. We'll have a far better URL when it goes live, but I shall click straight into the model. Um, so let's start with a supply question. Which setting are forecast to have the biggest percentage growth in registered nurses between 2019 to 2023? I can look at you now, I can see which ones are writing on paper, ones are not gonna do anything. So which, which setting? Um. Apart from the people on the board, you're far too far away to see what you're doing. You have to move, maybe wave your arms or something. Um, so let me go to the settings. Everyone got an answer? Acute, clinical, okay, right. So we look at it across the whole estate, um, uh, location, all NC, we'll look at individual settings. So let me just clear the screen there. And there's a running list down through here. Let's start with, uh, correctional and show um, just so you get an idea so this is correctional the darker blue line down through here is my mean guess but if you get any workforce planner who says in 2033 I know exactly how many nurses is going to be there will be exactly 813 they're lying 
if they're that good, they would be at Vegas putting money on some future bets. So what we've developed is a confidence interval. So we feel the truth is somewhere bouncing in here. So they get just to get a feel. So that's correctional. And if I then tick down through the list, home hospice. Oh, big number. Uh, uh, I won't do that one. Um, mental health. Nursing education. Nursing home. I click show. No, I haven't. There I have. Uh, community and population health. Um, so you've got an idea there and uh, the one I'm missing. Uh, ambulatory care is down through there, bigger, a, a bigger earth and let's put in in bigger context. Let's put in hospitals. So there's always a risk if I show hospitals, they're up here and everyone else down at the bottom gets ignored. So I held that one back, um, but in absolute growth, if you said ambulatory, is forecast the biggest growth. Go to the top of the stairs. It's 4,619. Like I said, who says it's exactly 19? 4,600 with a 41% increase uh, in the supply of uh, RNs in ambulatory settings. Um, not wishing to be biased. Oh, who got that right? Anyone sort of, yeah, I felt that was right. Or anyone said correctional facilities? Silence. I think we can count community as ambulatory care. It's, you know, close. close. Half point. Andrea Jepson has ambulatory. Oh, there, Andrea Jepson. Yep. Yes, yep. there. Bingo. Where's Andrea? Oh, she's hidden. I want a nice beaming smile looking smug or something, and I can ask the next question. Question number two. Same question, but for LPNs. What's the like, increase in uh, growth? Biggest setting for LPNs. Must I do that? I shall clear the screen and click LPNs. And ooh, which one do I avoid? I avoid that one. So, okay. We'll start an ambulatory. Nice big wiggly line. Uh, yeah. Correctional. Don't want that one. That's going to be the hospital down there. Mental health. Nursing home. Community. And which one of a forgotten home health? Down through there. Um, so purple one. Purple one is home health. So that's the biggest growth. Uh, we're seeing a 784, like I said, precise numbers, a 28% increase in LPN. So who said a home health? I don't not... believe anyone has home health, Andy, listed on there. I'm not sure that's good or bad. Yeah. Um, but there you are. <laughs> Question number three. Flipping to demand. We did supply before. Um, this is the new, new stuff uh, we haven't demoed before. So let's go to demand. In terms of percentage growth, which setting is exp will experience the biggest demand growth for RNs? Everyone got an answer? I'm not sure whether Kimberly's wiping her nose or hiding the answer. We can see. Uh, right, let's clear that one. Let's start with men. Let's start at the bottom. So community, um, population, um, mental health. Oh, let's do a hospital. Ooh, correctional. Well, I'm missing. Put on that one. There and oh, I'm doing LPNs. 
No wonder what I was showing on the screen and what I had down here bear no resemblance. Wrong answer. Um, let's start again. Um, correctional nursing home is there. Nurse education. Done that one. Mental health. Hospital. Home health. Inventory. And the biggest growth is the purple one, a uh, brown one, which is hospital. Um, but again, that's in total numbers. So in hospital, the biggest growth is 13,000 increase in demand. This is by headcount. Um, but if you look at it in percentage growth gro terms, it's nursing homes with 53%. So nursing is big. But as a percentage increase of changes, it's not as big as nursing homes, which is just two and a half thousand. But if you're in nursing homes, two and a half thousand shortage is a big issue. Two and a half thousand missing in hospital isn't. It's everything's relative. So you, there's strengths and weaknesses in that. Uh, so who, who said nursing homes as a percentage growth? Who said hospital? Well, then Arlene, admit I it. Arlene Imes had long term care and telehealth if I'm reading her response to the correct question. And then. Try to see. Andrea also had hospitals. hospitals. So the, the advantage of this of this tool, I would argue, is the fact that you can look at it in relative and absolute terms. So there were sometimes you have big numbers in a big area. That's just not in just a, sub, a setting, but also in a geography. So if you've got a densely populated area with a whole lot of people, you can expect a whole lot of shortages. But in a small area, an equivalent number would be a catastrophe. Uh, so it and so it's very difficult, as Erin said, to produce a book or a report of this because there's so many views. The beauty of the viz that you can click in and look at things. I'm just looking at a national level, uh, statewide level at this level at this point, but allows you to point click. Oh, oh, I can do this. I can do. It. Yes, you can. Um, let's do question four because I've already shown you um, uh, the LPN. If I look in at um, supply minus demand, that's the bit you really want to get attention. Diane, suddenly pay attention. Give me the differences. I'm not interested in supply or, or demand. What's the difference? Um, across all settings, will there be a surplus or shortage of uh, RNs or LPNs by, and by how much? So in 2033, will there be a positive or a negative number of LPNs and uh, RNs? And have a guesstimate of what you think it will be. So we can nice. start with registered nurses. What do you estimate there'll be a shortage or surplus of registered nurses? And it's in 2033, say, out. So that is, I can put both on screen so you can see a similar bit of context. So here, 2033 for RNs. That doesn't look right. Yes, it does. Um, the difference in uh, the blue line there is 14,000 for FTE short of RNs 2033. And for LPNs is 4.6 thousand by FTE. If you use it by headcount, depends how you think. Different people think different ways. You get a slightly different number, but it won't be positive if you're negative in FTV. It'll also be negative in headcount. Um, if you want that as a percentage, because some people are putting up percentages, um, as a difference between the solid blue line, the supply and the dotted line, for uh, um, LP, uh, RNs, that's a 14% shortage. And for LPNs, that's a 26% shortage. So again, that looks a tiny number relative to that, but in percentage terms, it's a big issue, if that's the right terminology. Um, da, 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 um, for RNs, 
forecasting a big shortage. Which setting is forecast to have the biggest shortage? And here we're talking numbers, the numeric shortage. So just yep. in terms of headcount, the setting with the greatest number of nurse need. That's ambulatory. That's correctional. Uh, home health. Mental health. Up here. Nursing education. Nursing home. Community population. And here it comes. Hospital. But I did the whole warm up app to realize oh, everyone else is in shortage in that small numbers. There is shortages. Um, everyone is in shortage for hospital. The numeric difference if I go up to here, uh, you've got a numeric distance by FTE of um, what's that? 10,000 short of RNs in 2033 just in hospital setting. Uh, but everyone is in shortage um, with the exception of who is the light pink and uh, the light pink is community health, but it is a small number relative size. Uh, so remember my curves of estimate of supply. It's about on target. Um, da -da -da -dum. LPNs. Any guesses for LPNs which would have the greatest numeric shortage? I'm suspicious some people answer the same question every time. I try to mix them up so there are different answers. It's like a multiple choice yeah. question. You can't keep on putting E and expecting it to be the right answer. You only get one <laughs> in five correct. I don't think no anyone passed an exam with one in five. Please say they don't. Um, let's clear that. So let's go. Which one am I avoiding? Ambulatory, correctional. I am doing RNs, aren't I? Yes, I am. Uh, correctional, hospital, mental health, community, ambulatory. Oh, I've done that one already. Which one am I missing? Guessing that one. Nursing homes. Um, given that um, what I said before, that's a um, big increase in the nursing home drive. So we're looking at 3,000, just over 3,000 short of LPNs, which is a big chunk of your total workforce of LPNs is this. It's a, it's a, a, a big issue. Um, I'm forecasting it's about a 50% shortage in supply of LPNs working in this nursing home. That's equivalent about 6.3 thousand. Um, FTE, uh, which is a big number. Um, quick interlude, the forecast, relax, I just showed you a demo, we give you some feeder information to help you answer the next question. So um, I've just looked at the national, uh, if I clear that off, but you can also look at um, subnational levels. So if I look at- Sorry, metro, can I just say he's looked at the state level, substate, sorry. Yeah. So we're yeah. in North Carolina, sub and now he's going to drill down to sub-state sub level. Sub, sub-state, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, so if I do all settings, so if I show that, so that is metro, non-metro, uh, that's the metropolitan shortage, and that is 3,000 short of, let's make sure LPNs, oh, let's clear that, let's do RNs and show. So that's the forecast of supply of RNs in metropolitan areas and the shortage of. We can flip to there and show that. And you get forecast in there. But it's difficult to compare those two because the population sizes in those are very different. It's, it's very much apples and pears. Where there's absolutely nobody, you have no healthcare needs. 
So it's very difficult to compare. So what we've built in is the mechanism of compare it against the total population. So then you're factoring what's the population you're serving in the non-metropolitan and the metropolitan areas. So you get a view on that. So you get a view from there. So the metropolitan areas uh, is these tan orangey things. Uh, we're forecasting a difference between the supply and demand per 10,000 of minus 13.7. Figure. If that's difficult to conceptualize, if I'd show um, uh, did, did Medicaid raisin, I want that, I want that, I want this. If I scroll forward to 2033, it's exactly the same data, but you've got a visualization of where the metropolitan and non metropolitan areas. So this number here of the minus 13.7 down here is this figure down here. Now I've done that. By population, with a total per 10,000 population, so I'm comparing pairs with pairs in an AHEC, sorry, in the Medicaid region, which Medicaid regions are projected to have across all settings the uh, biggest shortage? Any bids? And if you don't know the Medicaid regions, which you may not, they have numbers. Um, so here they are, and you can see the coding according to the map. So you can see the colors refer to the darker blue being Medicaid 5 with the very light um, color being Medicaid 4. So you can see the regions. And so what was the question once again, which ones have the greatest need or which one will? Which, which one in 2033? is forecast to have the biggest uh, shortage of RNs across all settings. Two. Now, since I get state and national confused, two and four is going to be really difficult for me, but they are. Uh, let's show. So 2030, 29, 2019 is our first forecast year and we're down through here. Let's move it through, move it through, move it through. Keep it going, keep it going. And I'm doing the wrong areas. Why didn't anyone shout? I was just about to. You're supposed to be the floor manager in my ear or something. I'm doing something wrong. But um, So that's better. There's more than two regions. That should, that should have been the clue. So 2019, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, scrolling it through, 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 scrolling it through and then I'm now off my screen. I have to scroll down there. So then we're down to here. So this is says, and this is when the bit, um, we're saying Northwest has the uh, greatest shortage. If I go to the brown, it, go sort of graze actively on the screen, uh, closely followed by the Piedmont Triangle area. Uh, forgive me if I pronounce this incorrectly. I'm doing it the English way. I know you have some foibles, but we, we have the same. Um, this is the bit when Aaron gets especially nervous when we say I have a surp surplus surplus in the southeast. Um, the reason for that is the computer model isn't factoring in human behavior. If in 2033 there is a surplus of nurses, um, I don't believe that there's nothing stopping them moving across the border. So what the model is not recognizing that it's not sort of, oh, I can't get a job here, I'm going to go over there. It is purely the supply of that forecast and that. So there's, it, in real life, it won't happen to this. So if you're from the southeast, I wouldn't put your feet up on the table and say, we've got this sorted. Jobs are good and no worries, um, because I can assure you people from the Northwest and the Piedmont area goes, OK, we've got a shortage. Where can we go and look? That's the strengths and weaknesses of this viz. Um, but that's what the computer model is going to look at. Um, geographies, what was my next question? Um, if I go by AHEC, um, any guess of which is the uh, worst hit AHEC, for want of a better phrase? Lynette's got a question mark.
I'm not sure what question mark means or the questions under, I mean, not understood. So I think the AHEX have names, don't they? Um, so if I go show. So that's the AHEX in 2019 um, across all settings. So if I then move the drag this across, can I keep up? Scroll down a bit, move across. Uh, we're showing um, Wake has the shortage, um, uh, biggest shortage relative to population. Um, that is the difference of supply minus demand. Uh, of the difference in populations. If you like numbers, I'm sorry. This is the stuff I do for a living. So I've taken the supply and demand divided by 10,000 population and then taken away the difference to give you the value of 18.8 and you get these large numbers. Um, if you take a, but that's not taken into consideration a sort of possible discussion point of, well, how many were in wake in the first place to give some sort of context? It's just giving an absolute difference. If, but we can also show it that way. So if I go to a hex and show that. And go up to 2033. It's a different way of showing exactly the same data. But you get a slightly different context. The worst will still be the worst or the best will still be the best, but it puts it in the context that wake had the, an enormous difference, but actually because of the bigger population already supply difference in supply over difference of demand, you get a slightly different context. Still a positive up here, but you can flip it different ways. Uh, it's not so much uh, um, giving the, uh, the right answer to the right person. I will show me there's a negative. Well, what negative do you mean? Is it a relative or absolute? It puts it in context. Often, if you're looking at certain geographies, it's worthwhile to do it in the two views to put it in the context of the view from there. Does that make sense? Final thing ish, final questions. We've come up with some scenarios. Um, there are an infinite number of scenarios. Uh, for those of you who like science fiction, there's an infinite number of parallel universes, but can only model a certain number. Um, so what we've looked at is a couple of scenarios. And if I was to go to supply and down through here and uh, da, 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 cross. Why am I not seeing this? All settings baselines to supply. I want to see all state. Where's that gone? Ah, that's why. Wrong click. I go all state, all settings, all through there. If I show that. So that's my forecast of um, LPNs, total number of LPNs. One scenario we modeled is what if everyone retired five years earlier than they normally would? Uh, possibly you could say they were burnt out and reasons for burnt out can be a very, very long list, but one particular scenario. So if you were um, age 70, uh, we're now going to, and uh, you would, the model will retire you at 70. We're going to answer everyone at the age of 65 gets retired. And all the probabilities, the probability of retiring at 60 was the probability at 65. So the older you get, the more likely you are to retire. Fingers crossed. Retirement leavers, most people leave at the end of retirement. So if we do that and shift retirement earlier for five years for everyone, I'll get a different forecast. OK, but there's still increasing growth that will still increase in growth. But how long do you think it will take to recover to get back to how many we had in 2019 as a result of that correction? How long do you think? I think it's a difficult question to get ahead, but it's I think it's very um, uh, uh, useful uh, because it puts in context slightly different change. So, uh, is it Amy? Uh, quickly put that. So yeah, okay. So let's put in retire. 
So that's the total number up through there. The great, and that's the green line there. So I've had an instant correction. Anyone over 65 retires, so down the numbers. I've still got a growth in coming up through, but the growth. It gets to 20. So we started here in tw at the top line with 87,000. So then I scroll along looking for an 87,000. So it basically is 2026. So it's not 20 years, but it is seven years. Yep, seven years to get back to what you had in 2019. But of course, the population's got older with more increased health needs. That doesn't mean demand has hung around waiting for you to catch up. It's just an indication of the effect of a short term, uh, just five years, people leaving earlier that has and how long it takes to recover. And what we are, yes, we are. Yes, we are, uh, Amy. Um, but what you can say is, that's OK, that's OK. Um, um, what we can do is just turn the tap on a bit more. If we train more nurses, then we can compensate for that. So we did this model that said, well, let's imagine overnight we have a 10% increase in the number of new graduates coming into the uh, work into uh, North Carolina overnight. Now, that's not possible, but it's a beauty with the model of what can be done. Uh, using that approach. Now you could say it can be done by increasing the number of students entering. You can say the increasing the level of retention so we don't lose any nurses. All the nurses we train, we get them to stay here and work. Um, and also you could say um, um, d d d they also work in nursing as well as coming through. So there's lots of uh, different habits. If I was in to increase it by 10%, What's going to be the difference? Will that make any difference in fixing uh, the uh, reduction in early years? What's your knee jerk reaction? 10% growth. Let's all work really hard with our educationists to increase 10% growth. Laura is deeply cynical. I congratulate you. If I show increase in graduates, a 10% increase in graduate supply, did you see it? It's that little blue line just shadowing the gray. So to in effect for the blue line to have any balancing for that green line, it should have been the flip side. So I'm just going to like three lane railway tracks would have been perfect. So if I get increase in supply, it compensates from that. It really has no effect. The increase, a 10% increase doesn't make that amount. Accumulatively, over a number of years, it does. So the learning point from here is stroke your existing staff uh, workforce, keep them, treasure them, feel free to increase the supply because you've still got a shortage. But having this um, big leaving because of five years earlier is very difficult, difficult to recover from. And that is at the statewide level. You can tunnel in to different geographies and you can find some really bad cases of places that are already bad. Um, bad's a bit emotional, um, but I'm just a numbers guy. Um, you can say that doesn't look good and it's not going to get any better. And that's the beauty of the viz. So if you're for a certain geography from certain interests, certain settings, you can play on this viz. And I'm over my budget. Thank you, Andy. Um, so the takeaway from that last point is really this issue that if if we see an exodus due to burnout or an exodus you know in the immediate short term I think in many cases legislators and others will think we'll just turn up the tap and in fact that's not going to address these shortages so we'll be as I'm going to mention producing documentation to sort of show that it really is going to be about retention so I hope this phase of the presentation has given you a sense of the numbers of ways that you can cut the data by setting by geography for RNs LPNs um, and uh, we'll flip it over to Evan um, to be able to show you the education viz um, details as well. And then we'll handle questions and answers at the end. Thank you, Andy. Um, let's see, are you all seeing uh, my screen now? It should be back on the front page of yep, the you're good. website. Okay, great. 
Um, so I'm going to click. Um, so the model that Andy was was working on is over here. I'm going to click on this one though. Um, under program diffusion. And so this is something that came out of um, data that Andy essentially needed anyhow for the model. Um, what he needed to know, uh, among many other things, is um, when a nurse graduates, where are they two years later? So he can model movements um, in the early in the pipeline, essentially. When we uh, looked at this data, we realized that it was actually pretty interesting data kind of in its own right. And so we decided to build um, build something up around it so people could take a look at this data. So I'm going to just um, pull up one and then I'll kind of explain what, ev what everything is that you're looking at. So I'm going to start with, um, let's do LPN. So up here you choose a nurse program type. So I'm going to choose LPN. And then you can select an institution. Um, and so let's see, where's Foresight? There it is. And then you click Add. OK, so what we have now is you have this map of North Carolina, obviously. And this little marker here is the location of Forsyth Tech. And then each of these little dots represents a, uh, the location, the practice location of a nurse two years after um, graduating from Forsyth Tech uh, in the LPN program. Uh, so these are so this is essentially a cohort. So between 2015 and 2018. So if you if you graduated in 2013 to 2016, where were you two years later um, in each of those cases? So um, so you can see that these are actually you can zoom in on it a little bit, but you're not actually going to see exactly where people are because they're randomized to zip code. Um, but you can see, you know, it's dense around kind of um, Winston-Salem. This ellipse here is to help kind of show the um, approximate spread of a program's graduates because it can be kind of hard to um, look at the dots and get a good idea of this. And so what this ellipse is, is it's a ellipse constructed to have about two thirds of that program's graduates. So it gives you a sense of the spread of the um, of that program's graduates. So down here, you also get a table that summarizes some of the um, key data points um, for this uh, program's students uh, during these years. Um, so you can see, you know, the program type, the overall N. So this is how many data points essentially we had, how many nurses we had in that um, for that uh, institution in our data set. <clears throat> and then um, a few key settings. Um, uh, we also have the number who ended up in a rural county. Um, and then we also just as kind of a proxy for spread, the mean distance in miles that so basically the the distance between wherever they are practicing and, and where they um, where they went to school. And then this last data point is actually pulled from um, NC Tower, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, part of the North Carolina Common Follow-up System. And um, we just thought this was an interesting data point to pull in because this tells you uh, the percent retention in North Carolina for that program overall. So this is this piece is not our data or the licensure data at all. Um, it's it's a piece of um, the common follow up system, but importantly, what this tells you in most cases, which um, any of the educators are probably aware of, is that you actually have um, pretty high, you know, 90 ish percent uh, retention for most programs, which is helpful. Um, well, for many reasons, but <laughs> in this specific case, it's helpful because that means that we're actually getting with the licensure data most of the graduates from these institutions. They're not, um, you know, two years after they're not all out of state and we don't know where they went. And so when we were looking at these spreads, they're actually probably pretty accurate, um, you know, minus someone who randomly goes moves to California or something like that. Um, but uh, so I'm going to show you a few more of these um, so you can kind of get a feel for how this works. Oh, and one other thing I just want to point out in the functionality is you can click on the marker here and you can get some more detail on all the different settings. Um, 
So you see, for instance, you know, 26 ended up in a hospital setting and 43 ended up in an ambulatory care setting, which is the same as this data down here, but you get more settings. So let's go ahead and um, let's add some other ones. So why don't we look at the ADN program of Forsyth Tech as well? OK, so you see that maybe a little more spread, but pretty similar, actually. Um, you know, they, they tended to stay pretty close. Um, so let's why don't we look at um, a BSN program because that might have a very, very different uh, kind of look. Uh, so for instance, let's take a look at um, Winston-Salem since that's in the same area. So there you see, you can see that a much bigger spread. You see more people headed out towards Charlotte, some headed towards the Triangle. Um, also kind of interesting is you look at um, North Carolina A&T. So just a little bit over, you know, towards Greensboro. And that's enough to kind of pull the, the gravity of this ellipse and, and encompass the Triangle. So you see more of those graduates kind of going that, uh, going uh, east essentially. Um, so you can compare those. And one other thing that, um, so oh, let me just go down here to the table again. So again, you can see all the different um, stats for those different programs. Um, you can also control this. So if you get a bunch on there that you don't, and you realize uh, there's too many, um, you know, it's a lot of dots and a lot of colors, you can always um, close them out. So you can close them out by either coming up here, clicking on that little X, or you can come down here and click on the X in the table. Um, also, I should note that you can um, download a CSV um, of the of the data, so it'll essentially be an expanded version of this table, um, so you can take a look at it, uh, the data for yourself. Um, and so one other thing I just wanted to show was that the um, that I just came across and I thought was really interesting was if you look at the LPN programs and look at uh, Ron Cabarrus, and we click add. So this is really interesting to me, and you know this is kind of a data wonk type thing. But when I was looking at this, and I found this, and I saw this pattern, it really gave me like a lot of confidence in kind of the validity of this data, because <laughs> this is exactly the shape I would expect. This very because of the the position of this institution between um, a couple of population centers it ends up pulling the graduates there along 85 in each direction. And so um, I just thought this was totally fascinating that you see this kind of um, this distribution or this you know, uh, diffusion happening um, in, in that ellipse. Uh, so anyhow, I, I obviously had a lot of fun looking at this and, and, um, and finding things out about the different institutions in our state. So I hope you do as well. Any uh, questions? Oh, sorry, go ahead. We'll hold the questions. I think we're, I want to ask Madam Chair, uh, I know that we are pushing time here, so I want to ask uh, whether we're okay to be able to continue to go so I can just summarize the dissemination, but I want to be respectful of people's time. Maybe we'll summarize and then take a short break. So okay to go to, sem to dissemination, perfect. Then I will do that. to my slideshow and um, so the next steps I'm just going to be very brief uh, we're going to finalize the website uh, launch the model to the public disseminate findings uh, we will uh, part of what we have to do is both educate and engage stakeholders in the findings but also how to use the model um, and the f for the eggheads among us and our peers we're going to want to talk about the methodology that we used um, you have in, in the slides and in the documentation who we saw as the key stakeholders. Um, if I would encourage you, if there's anyone missing from this list that you let us know, but when we went through this list, sort of thinking about, you know, nursing practice and human resource managers, uh, you know, COOs and CEOs of, of organizations that are making decisions about how to deploy nurses, nurse educators, et cetera, you can see the list here. Um, but 
please, we welcome if there's someone missing from this list, let us know and, and we uh, will put them, uh, focus our efforts on them. The rollout plan, so we're not just going to release this model and let people play with it. We're going to actually combine it with written and visual information. So these will be blogs. We will be actively tweeting. We're going to have a number of policy briefs. Those policy briefs will focus on the overall uh, projections of shortages, but also by employment setting. And we're going to partner with AHEC around ge geographic shortages. And then for there'll be those technical documentation uh, pieces for people who really want to dig into the details. So those will be the things that you can sort of go to if you want to, but then we're going to have interactive places where we'll be doing interactive um, visualization demonstrations and we'll be doing that with the press. We'll have a set of how to videos so that if you can't attend or don't want to attend one of those presentations, you can bring up the video. And one of the things that I'm most excited about is we're going to hopefully engage with some experts. So we'll bring a dean with a, with a, a chief nursing officer with others to sit around and say what what do they use this model for? We already know they're excited about it because we've already engaged with them, but it will be great testimony to the power of the model and how it's useful to them as a stakeholder. Then we'll be engaging with the press, uh, both through the UNC's outlet, but local news will love this. One of the things we know is, you know, they're always looking for that local story um, and, the, and the field specific employment settings will be very important for, for their um, press too. We intend to engage on longer term dissemination uh, beyond the, the term of this contract because we know that there will be continued interest in this. We are very excited and thank you for the invitation to attend your education summit. We are very much looking forward to that, but there will be other conferences, um, hopefully someday in person, um, that we will be attending and disseminating this information. Um, because we're academics, we do love a good manuscript, so there'll be some good manuscripts in some of those in partnership with the board uh, and continuing as asked to give stakeholder presentations. And as you may have seen, Higher Ed Works uh, did a big piece on Help Wanted with nurses. They came and interviewed Dr. Jones and I, uh, and we sat down and, and did a series of videos, which I think are pretty powerful and have gotten picked up by local press. Uh, and as an example, the News and Observer picked it up. Um, this was our way almost of creating, you know, when you go to the movies and they have a trailer, we wanted to create that trailer coming soon. The North Carolina Board of Nursing Workforce model to really generate interest and help people begin to understand the power of this tool. So we wanted to ask you, um, we do we do not yet have a name for the model. We're thinking something like North Carolina NurseCast, but we're open to it. We don't need to decide today, but we're asking for your feedback on that as well. So that's really our dissemination plans um, that we plan to move forward um, in terms of getting this model out. You've seen the power of the model. Uh, it's very powerful, but we know we're going to need to interpret it for people. Um, we know that not everyone's a geek like us and likes to dig into playing with it. We're going to have to interpret the data for people and that's really this next phase. We've already begun working on it. Our new staff member um, is uh, Emily McCarthy who's working with us on that. So thank you for your time today. I'm sorry that we went slightly over and I look forward to the question and answer um, session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freer. Uh, should we take a break and come back for question and answer or do question and answer? I'm fine either way. Okay. What would uh, people like to do? I think it depends on how long the question and answer session is. If it's if we're talking 15 minutes or so, that's not a big deal. But if it's going to run much longer than that, I think we'd probably want to take a break. OK, thanks, Tom. Dr. Freyer, how long do you think this will be? As long as the questions last, huh? Exactly. That is entirely up to you. And our team is, is able to stay through a break, whatever you, you choose. So I thought it was interesting when we were looking at, you know, if people will retire because I just read in the most recent AONL journal and it scared me that the average age of faculty in the country, so it was the US, did you see that Laura? It's 65. Um, and we are having trouble, Dr. Milner can tell us and others, recruiting faculty. Um, so how are we going to keep those lines going up with the supply if we don't have the educators. 
Exactly, and the model does account for the, the age distribution of the workforce and retirement patterns. Um, and I think, you know, getting those nurses into the pipeline for the long term is a really important issue. And we know that that you know, Andy gave that example. If we waved a wand and increased by 10%, listen, we can't do that. We don't have the nursing faculty. We don't have pre we yeah. have huge preceptor shortages, right? We've got things going on, and that's why we wanted to focus you and legislators well, on a key issue that really comes through in this model is that what we need to do is hold on to our existing workforce. And so, one of the messages that we'll be hammering hard with this model is to organizations you're going to have to pull out every trick in the book to kill to keep your nurses um, because it's actually your existing workforce and though. we are yeah yeah and i know people are so but you know if that takes new finances we need to make sure we're messaging that um to the legislature there's all sorts of and we we look to you it's like what's needed and how can this model help leverage those conversations madam chair i have had several board members text and said can we have a five minute break can <laughs> we can that's fine with me I need some eye drops, so I'm I'm with you. Can we come back, Dr. Freer, in five minutes? We are with you when you come back. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
Welcome back. Can you all hear us now? Excellent, excellent. I just wanted to um, honestly thank you, Dr. Freyer and your team. We are just blown away by this information and wow, I can just see so much, you know, like you said, the manuscripts and all and just us, you know, in North Carolina, this is such great work. But I really wanted to thank Julie George because she was forward thinking. I remember when we started talking about this years ago and Julie said, yes, we need to do another supply and demand and started having the conversations. Who would have known this would have been so timely? So thank you, Julie, for uh, bringing us up to date. So. Indeed. So now uh, questions from board members. Just uh, unmute and identify yourself and take it away. Anyone? All right. Good. Hey, this is Lynetta. Uh, thank you. What a beautiful presentation uh, and as others commented as well. Great information. Um, any any idea how this might impact nursing salary demands or trends in North Carolina? And it's a really good question. It is a really good question. That is the same question the News and Observer asked me. Um, and, you know, we were not tracking as part of this model nursing salaries. But for those of you uh, who are economists, um, clearly a, a shortage uh, in a labor market usually results in an increase in wages. Um, and it could really. It, and one of the issues we're running into is the number of um, traveling nurses who are getting very large wages. Um, it and so totally can, imbalances everything. Exactly. So you can see that wage pressure in the travelers. And the other piece that, that is somewhat uh, problematic, I would say more than somewhat, is this growing disparity between education nurses who are in academic settings and clinical settings, right? And 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 that disparity has it, it exacerbates the, the shortage of, of educating uh, the educating faculty. So I am I think to Lynette, I think it's a great, a great question and, and you can sort of project in where these outcomes could go, but you perhaps have other ideas about the way you think this could play out. Um, and, and, and others definitely add your feedback, but um, I, I just, I'm just hoping that, you know, North Carolina and, and nationwide that we don't get behind, too far behind the issue and then you know, whatever salary increase recommendations in whatever practice areas have that projected shortage, that it's not a re, you know, too much of a reactionary type response. And you can see the growing demand and you can see nurses making exits even early in their nursing career with not really what you consider traditional experience, maybe, I don't know, right at a year into experience and practice and and leaving going to um, these travel agencies, these great contracts that are offering the money. But, you know, as far as the experience that's required to function, you're seeing them with one year experience, Lenata, yeah. uh, which we never would have seen in travelers before. You were supposed to be guaranteed they could walk in and a couple of days orientation and they could go. They're also standing side by side with the nurse that's not making one hundred and fifty dollars an hour. Yes. Um, so when Dr. Freyer talked about, you know, retaining and and keeping them as treasure, it doesn't feel like you're treasured when the person beside you is making that much more money. However, you've got a staff, so it really is a double edged sword. Laura, do you have any thoughts about LPNs moving into acute care and then how acute care might be able to compete with long-term care for salaries for LPNs? Well, I can only speak from experience and from experience as a new graduate LPN, I went to work in acute care and that's where I got acquired my foundational experience, I guess you could say. And from there, um, went to long-term care. Um, I'm not sure how 
it, rephrase your question again for me. Go well, ahead. I know I just really wanted to know your thoughts because I know you are an expert. And I was just wondering about the LPN. Um, I know that um, I believe Moses Cohn has uh, put them back in inpatient. Duke Raleigh is testing on a unit um, in our system and uh, Duke Regional is looking at it. So I just was wondering what you know what you thought and and we do see a lot of new PN programs yes um, be, uh, maybe where they had them before in our community college system bringing them back so yes. it's exciting to me to see um, the licensed practical nurse um, valued and I yeah I do believe they're you. very under underused underutilized for what they can do I don't think a lot of facilities uh, agencies realize what they are able to do and uh, do not use them to their full potential. So uh, the, I think that could offset if we went back to more of a team uh, nursing model that we used to do years ago, where you had the, the RN, the LPN and the NA, I think that would cover, be able to cover the demand better than paying someone else $100 an hour. <laughs> and so <laughs> our, all of our redeployment <laughs> plans include going back to team nursing in some kind of yes. fashion, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's yeah. a really good point. Thanks, Laura. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Questions, comments for this team that's done such a phenomenal job? This is Arlene, I do. Um, I'm partial to telehealth. How do you see uh, the growth in nursing with telehealth? Arlene, thank you. I've been having a back channel conversation with my team during this whole presentation about telehealth um, and we could never have anticipated uh, the growth of telehealth right I mean the, the fact that CMS so dramatically changed reimbursement during COVID um, and I think that's definitely one of those things that we have to think about if we continue to partner with the board around modeling or around data is sort of how to capture the number of nurses working in telehealth um, both for the number and being able to project supply and demand because I do think it will continue to grow I think people have discovered new ways of delivering care that will continue and persist as long as that reimbursement continues to persist. And that, you know, CMS has said they'll continue to fund it in the short term. They have made no long-term guarantees, right? This is a classic modeling nightmare. You sort of can project a scenario, but you don't quite know how it's going to play out. And in other work that we're doing, we're also trying to understand the effect of telehealth on geography. So if we see a shortage in a particular geography, that could be ameliorated through telehealth. And so I think it's a great question. I wish I had a more satisfying answer for you, but I think we're going to need to partner with the board around how to capture uh, those data and begin to think through. And I don't know if anyone else on my team has any ideas uh, that they want to provide or anyone who's working more closely in telehealth as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Other questions? Pam, we hope that you all will continue to give us feedback. So if I can ask for a couple of specific asks here. Number one around, you know, if you like North Carolina NurseCast or if you really don't like it, could you please let us know because that will actually be the URL for this model. So we want to use a name that, that the board likes. Um, number two, uh, we sent you the technical documentation. If you have any ideas or places where you think the technical documentation might be in need of improvement, it's really supposed to be written for a layperson. Um, so if you have a chance to read that documentation and, you know, if, if come uh, Sunday night, you can't sleep. Um, I highly recommend it uh, as, a, as a soporific tool. Um, <clears throat> and the third ask would be, you know, sometimes it, 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 we, we present a lot of information and it's very sort of we know it, but but you you may find yourself mulling. Uh, you know, I wish I'd asked this. I wish I'd asked that. We are at the phase where your questions could not be more important. So could you please, as you're having questions about the model or, or either presentation, from Andy or Evan, please shoot them to us. And I mean that because our team is in that critical point of dissemination right now. So thank you so much for your engagement and the funding and for your partnership in this and for, to Julie George as well. And thanks for the opportunity to present today. Thank you and thank the whole team. 
I'm really grateful for my team. <laughs> they're, they're amazing. And just just um, monitoring the chat, board members love the name Nurse Cat. I like it too. Yeah, so we might just have an answer for you now. I like it. Thank you. So are we ready to? Hesitation. Oh, was echoing. I was somebody monitor the uh, the chat. Yeah, you could go off of your video and uh -huh. just watch the chat. And okay. Chat and just let me know when people need a break again. Yeah, I, I, need I might I might have over overgone there. So I get so excited with uh, Dr. Freyer's work. Okay, we're going to move on to um, education and practice. And I'd like to recognize the committee chair, Dr. Raquel Ingram, and recognize the committee liaison, Dr. Jennifer Lewis, for M17. And Crystal mentioned this, um, Dr. Tillman mentioned this in her um, earlier summary that um, we were looking at the approval to extend the Education and Practice Committee 2021 charge. So, Dr. Ingram. Dr. Lewis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, making certain that I'm not muted. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. OK, great. So um, first of all, I would like to recognize the members of the committee. Um, I'm the chair, as previously mentioned, um, Raquel Ingram. Um, we also have Lori Ann Lewis, uh, Dr. Anne Marie Milner, Kimberly McKnight, Andrea Jep Jepson, excuse me, Dr. Laura Bartlett, and Lynetta Howard. And so in January of 2021, the board charged the Education and Practice Committee to review best practices for nursing education program regulation, the related law and rules, and recommend any needed revisions to the North Carolina Board of Nursing Education rules in 21 NCAC 36.0300, which is approval of nursing programs to the board. So the committee met on March 17, 2021, and also on August 10, 2021, to engage in work needed to meet this charge. So some of the key points include um, a, a comprehensive review of Section 300 of the North Carolina Administrative Code has not occurred in recent years, and during this time, there have been ongoing changes in nursing education, as well as in the overall delivery of health care. The Education and Practice Committee wants to assure that the North Carolina Board of Nursing Rules regulating pre-licensure nursing education programs are current, consistent, and conducive to the preparation of nurses who can provide safe, effective nursing care. Therefore, the committee saw the need to review and possibly revise the education rules. So at the first meeting of the new charge, the board staff researched and gathered materials to undergird the work of the committee, which are noted in our first four bullet points of the report. At the second meeting, the committee received stakeholder feedback from varied parties, all with an interest in nursing education regulation in North Carolina. Now, the committee has accomplished much to date and continues to continues working a robust plan to meet the established charge. However, the committee recognizes the need for more time to fully deliberate the testimony provided by stakeholders and uh, to digest the literature provided by staff and also to direct staff to develop revisions based on the committee's assessments. Uh, the committee fully anticipates the work of reviewing and revising the education rules to extend beyond the last meeting of this calendar year, which is to be held on November 3rd, 2021. Therefore, we as a committee are proactively asking the full board to extend the current charge. And so with that being said, um, Madam Chair, we do have a recommendation that the Education and Practice Committee, um, we are recommending the North Carolina Board of Nursing extend the current charge of the Education and Practice Committee into the uh, 2022 calendar year. Thank you, Dr. Ingram. Is there any discussion before we call for a vote?
Okay, this is a committee recommendation, so we do not need a second. We'll now call for the vote. When your name is called, please respond to prove if you're in favor of the motion or opposed if you're not in favor of the motion. Dr. Anne Marie Milner? Approve. Arlene Imes? Approve. Lynetta Howard? Approve. Andrea Jepson? Approved. Kimberly McKnight? Approved. Dr. Raquel Ingram? Approve. Dr. LaDonna Thomas? Approve. Dr. Laura Bartlett? Approve. Chester Farley? Approve. Tom Minowitz? Approve. Lori Lewis? Approve. Dr. Amy Steele? Approved. Diane Layden? Approved. And Pam Edwards approved, so the motion carries. Thank you. And now we'll move to um, item M18, alternate scheduling options slash enrollment expansion that Dr. Tillman also mentioned earlier. And I believe is Dr. Terry Ward going to be presenting? Yes, I am, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Northeastern University is a private university located in Boston, Massachusetts with a regional campus in Charlotte, North Carolina. Northeastern University requested a program change and expansion of enrollment to its current accelerated Bachelor of Science in Nursing program located on the Charlotte, North Carolina regional campus. The request was received in the Board of Nursing Office in February of 2021. The request for proposed program change is to extend the accelerated baccalaureate and nursing program located in Charlotte, North Carolina. The program change and expansion request proposes to open a transfer pathway into the current accelerated Bachelor of Science nursing program for initial degree earning students. The pathway will be four consecutive semesters or 16 continuous months with nursing courses beginning in the initial semester of the program. The Northeastern University refers to this pathway as the BSNC pathway. The pathway will require 131 credit hours, 63 credit hours of non-nursing credits, 59 hours of which may be earned in any discipline and will be counted as transfer credits into the program and 68 hours of nursing. The university proposes to admit 288 students comprised of a combination of accelerated and BSNC students. The university is currently approved for 192 students and is requesting an expansion in enrollment of 96 students. The program enrollment as of 10-21-2020 is 102. This calculates a 63% of the current approved enrollment being utilized. The proposed date for admission to the first class is spring 2022. Graduation of the first class is scheduled for spring 2023. The proposed program will be physically located on the Northeastern University campus in Charlotte, North Carolina. The program change and expansion requests demonstrate evidence of the proposed student population, projected enrollment, evidence of learning resources and financial resources, which are adequate to begin and maintain the BSNC pathway. The current physical facilities are adequate to support the program needs. North in Eastern University has authority for degree to grant granting from the New England Commission on Higher Education and is nationally accredited by the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education. Dr. Grace Buttress is the program director. Dr. Buttress began her appointment on August 23, 2021 and is available today should you have more specific questions. The request includes course syllabi, course descriptions, course objectives, evidence of learning resources, and clinical experience. 
the three-year average licensure exam pass rate for 2018 to 2020 is 87%. A precedence for a transfer, transfer pathway into the accelerated baccalaureate of nursing pathway for initial degree earning students does not exist at Northeastern University Bouvier College of Health Sciences located in Boston, Massachusetts. There is also no precedence for this type of pathway in North Carolina or among the North Carolina Board of Nursing peer member boards. General education requirements were reviewed by board staff and in collaboration with the University of North Carolina system. The UNC system office did not determine there was a significant difference in what was proposed versus what Northeastern University already has in place. Therefore, the UNC system did not engage an expert in a detailed review, which is sometimes done. There is a paucity of literature available on this type of pathway or the impact of this type of pathway on the program outcomes. The recommended board action is that North Univers Northeastern University be granted approval to extend the accelerated baccalaureate in nursing to include a pathway for initial degree earning students and enrollment expansion of 96 students for a total of 296 students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ward. So staff has just made uh, the recommendation that we grant uh, Northeastern University approval to extend the accelerated baccalaureate in nursing to include a pathway for initial degree earning students and enrollment expansion of 96 students to a total of 296 students. Do I have a motion to accept staff's recommendation? This is Tom. I'll make a motion that we accept staff's recommendation. We have a motion. Uh, do we have a second? This is Kimberly, I second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, yes, Madam Chair, this is Raquel. Um, I just have a few questions. Am I allowed to ask? Yes, um, uh, we can have time? discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, um, and so I can't I, I see you because We've got someone wanting to be admitted, but um, please proceed, Raquel. OK, um, so I was just I wanted to start off with saying that I appreciate the um, creativity and the um, innovation of this uh, pathway, but there were just some things that I just needed clarity um, about. And so um, this is BSNC. Um, and so with BSNC, I'm accustomed to BSNC, the completion being R into BSN. Um, and so this pathway, my question is, um, is it it's bypassing like the traditional um, associate degree or R into BSN pathway? Is that accurate? I'm going to have to ask one of the um, education. Dr. Ward, are you yeah. able to answer? Yes, I am here, Dr. Ingram, and I would like to defer that question to Dr. Butcher. She's here and available on the call. Okay. You might be on mute. I can't hear. I'm not sure if others can, but I can't. I, I can't, we can't hear you. No, but Sam, is she muted? Should we um, let Brad consult with her and have a short break? Let's take a five minute break and see if our IT person can consult with her so that we can be able to hear the answer. Okay. Is that okay with everyone? Yes, thank, thank you.
Hi, Ms. Buttress. Uh, uh, we have you unmuted on our end. You will need to go to the device settings in Teams or uh, allow permission to the browser if you're using a browser to access your microphone. Um, the device settings in Teams, if you're using the application, is a three dot menu at the top right near the leave button, and we're looking for device settings. And then I'm not really sure how your AV is set up on that end, but it will it will need to be whatever the room microphone is it, uh, is called. Huh. Darn it. I hear you. Can you hear me now? No, no. Yes. Okay. Oh. Got it? <laughs> Miss Wheeler, did you say you could hear me? Thank you. Okay. Yes, thanks. I'm also going to put a phone number in the chat um, in the event that you would need to call in and uh, that way. Okay, are you able to hear me now? Yes, okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Now, Dr. Ingram, would you repeat your question because now we're able to communicate? Sorry for the technical difficulty. Okay, so then I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, my comment was, of course, I appreciate the um, innovation and the creativity, but I do have a few questions. Um, and so um, my question, one of my, or my initial question is the, um, BSNC is typically R in the BSN, so BSN completion, but the pathway that you're proposing seems to surpass traditional pathways. And so my question is, um, uh, like with the associate degree and the R into BSN, and so I, I'm just wanting to know more about how this 
impacts or involves or don't involve that traditional, those traditional pathways? Thanks for your question. So this is a transfer track. A student can come in with 59 credit hours of undergraduate work to include their prerequisites, or they may have an associate degree before they come in. So it's more of a transfer to um, a BSN in nursing as, as opposed to a completion track. Okay, and so um, and they're going to it's going to be a part of your current accelerated your ABSN option. Which yes. Are, yes, yes, okay. which is yes, um, it will be the uh, four semester 16 month program. OK, and so the new path that you're proposing, um, well, let me just back up a minute. Your accelerated option, they already those uh, candidates, if you will, already have a degree. They have a, a bachelor's degree, yes, and the prerequisites are met. OK, and so what you're proposing is um, or I should guess I should ask the question because it's not clear to me. I apologize. Um, they will not have a degree, but they are entering into a degree option type pathway. Correct. Yes. So it'll be a transfer track. So again, a, an associate degree or 59 credit hours undergraduate, they'll transfer into our 16 month uh, ABSN program. OK, um, and so also with that, the prereqs are the are will they take the same? Are they required to take the same prereqs as the accelerated option yes. students? Yes, exactly the same prerequisites. OK, um, and so the the UNC um, system is did you all consult with the UNC system and Yes, as Dr. Ward mentioned, we consulted with the UNC system in addition to the community college system of North Carolina. And so um, with this transfer track, any courses taken within the community college are, will be acceptable for this track. And any courses taken in a community college outside of North Carolina will be individually assessed when we do a transcript evaluation. OK, and so also with that, um, if I'm understanding correctly, and I, and I know I'm filled with questions, so if you could just please well, bear okay. with me just trying to understand. Um, these graduates will be able to enter into a second degree type program without a without a bachelor's degree and complete a nursing program bypassing the traditional pathways and have this degree within three years. So in a typical ABSN program, a student has had a bachelor's or higher degree. What we are proposing is a student would have an associate degree or the 59 credit hours, and they could transfer into the accelerated BSN program. As we all know, accelerated programs vary in length. So our program is, is 16 months. They would transfer in. They would be with students who, who hold the baccalaureate degree, and they would take the same curriculum, same prerequisites. They would graduate with the same degree. Right, of course. OK, um, and so um, your home base is in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And yes. so is there any reason why you don't have this program in Massachusetts or? The, the, uh, we don't have it yet. It is a possibility. So it was first proposed in Charlotte and the hope the other um, ABSM program in Massachusetts is in Burlington, Massachusetts, and they're looking to see what happens in North Carolina and hopefully they can also um, have the same type of program. OK, um, and so again, I, I find it interesting. I just would love to just have more information about it. I think this this would be big um, for North Carolina and big in a way that could absolutely be great. Um, but then, you know, we do have to be careful. And so I would just love more um, information about this, this newly creative and innovative proposal. So in the form of questions, Dr. Ingram, or? I'm sorry. Feel free to go ahead and ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's the, it's like a for me, uh, Madam Chair, you don't know what you don't know. I would love to I, I hear and I thank you for answering my questions, but there's just still some components. Um, I think if I had something that I could like read the information, 
um, it would just help for me to have clarity um, just with that, you know, educator hat on. So. Other discussion from other board members. I, I'm sorry, this is Lynetta. The more that uh, I guess uh, hearing the questions clarification, um, I, I, I think it would be great to hear more information so that we make, you know, really informed decisions. So great dialogue and, you know, every question I'm like kind of sitting at the edge of my seat, hearing the question, hearing the answer. So I, I, certainly, I think more information. So, okay. Um, other board members, I, I I see, I see you. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Laura, uh, I saw you. Yeah, like I, I, I guess I'm like Raquel. I'm still not real sure what the difference is here. Um, they're taking an associate degree. Does that mean an, like an associate degree in nursing or no. just any associate degree? Well, it wouldn't be an associate degree in nursing because they're getting a nursing degree with this program. So uh -huh. science, we are, we are looking at targeting associate degree in science or any health care related field. So it is degree completion. That's what this is. So they are mm -hmm. transferring in with their credits or with their associate degree into our degree completion program. Um, you know, I taught in ABSN programs for the past 18 years and we have used uh, a degree as a part of our admission process, but this is a new innovative way for an associate degree or those who have the credits to, to transfer in and complete their batch, their bachelor's degree in nursing. So what nursing courses are in this um, program? In the um, in our nursing in our ABSM program. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, let's we have fundamentals of nursing. We have maternity nursing, pediatric, adult health one and two, mental health practicum, research, um, community nursing, every uh, course that is in um, typical baccalaureate programs. So, so, would, it, so it seems like the differentiator is really that you're taking any uh, associate degree and taking those credits and, and that's what's different from uh, most ABSN programs, they have a bachelor's and another mm -hmm. Right, and, and correct, and um, ABSM programs will take a bachelor's degree in anything in addition to the prerequisites. You could have a bachelor's degree in art or history and go into an ABSM program. So right. right now we're targeting those students that have an associate degree in science and they're looking for something more for, um, you know, for future work. And this is one way we look to alleviate the nursing shortage in North Carolina, which we've talked about a lot this morning. Okay, so it almost be like, um, completing my first two years at community college, getting an associate degree in any in science yes. mm -hmm. and then saying now I want to I want to go on to my four year degree and I'm going to do my last two years quote uh, of degree as as a in nursing. So right. it's almost and like the four years of if as if I went to four year nursing um, for my BSN, uh, those first two years really aren't nursing focused It's those last two years. So this is be the same thing. That's correct. And if you look at most nursing curriculums, it's a four semester curriculum, and that's what we have here in the ABSN. And maybe what's confusing is that it's an accelerated BSN, but in reality, it's four semesters like most baccalaureate programs. Other questions from board members? Dr. Ingram? I have another question. Yes. And so um, an associate in science, but are there others who um, if you don't have an associate in science, are they able to have completed prereqs and just come right in and start taking nursing courses? I guess that's what's confusing right. to me. And so if I could like see. Yeah, oh, no, I understand. So 50, yeah, the, the other option would be you have 59 credits undergraduate, plus it, you have our prerequisites met and you come in and you do a degree completion with us. So and as she suggested, the first two years of the community college or the 59 credit. So you don't have to have a, an associate degree for this degree completion, but you do need the 59 credits plus the um, prerequisites. It's just a different way of looking at it. OK, so I again, I appreciate um, the dialogue and you're answering my questions, but I, I would just love to just see it in 
you know, in the hopes that it will just be dynamic. But <laughs> no, I have, so we do have approval from the Board of Governors, if anybody okay. was wondering. So we have received that approval. So is this a face to face or online program? Um, the students will, um, they're in their clinical experiences, they come in for simulation, they come in for in-person testing, and then the courses are online, as we are currently doing with our current ADSN students. Other board members with questions or comments? More discussion? We do have a motion on the table and a second. Um, so I'll call for the vote. When your name is called, please respond approve if you're in favor of the motion or opposed if you're not in favor of the motion. Madam Dr. Chair. Dr. Anne Marie Milner. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. I'm sorry. Just am I muted? Hello? You're, you're yeah, on. Go ahead, Raquel. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was just um, I'm not sure what the proper process um, is, Madam Chair, but I would move that we postpone postpone the question until the January board meeting to allow uh, the board more time to consider the question. I'm seeing in the chat that some others wanted um, more information so that we can make an informed decision. So can we be specific and let them know exactly um, what we want? You want a curriculum spread? You want course descriptions? Um, I don't know that, and I'll just speak for what I'm looking for. I don't necessarily need course descriptions, but I would just like to see the differences um, in the programs. Um, that the one that is currently in place and what's being proposed um, along with like the, the gen eds. Um, I would also like to see more information about, um, you know, it was indicated that there's not a lot of information on this type of pathway. So more information about what is available in regard um, to this pathway. Is that sufficient for board staff, Dr. Tony? Okay, so we, um, Raquel Ingram has made a motion to postpone the question until the January board meeting uh, to allow the board move to have more time to consider the question. Uh, do I have a second? This is Lynetta Howard, I second. Lynetta Howard has seconded the motion. Any further discussion? If there's if there's not, we'll call for the vote. Um, when your name is called, please respond approve if you're in favor of delaying the decision to the January meeting um, or opposed if you are not in favor of the motion. Dr. Anne Marie Milner. I oppose. I'm I'm pretty clear on this, so I oppose that. Delaying. Pardon me, I didn't hear it, Anne Marie. I'm sorry, I oppose delaying. Okay. Uh, Arlene Imes. Approve. You approve delaying? Yes. Okay. Uh, Lynetta? Approve. Uh, Andrea Jepson? Approve. Um, Kimberly McKnight? Approve. Dr. Raquel Ingram? Approve. Dr. LaDonna Thomas? Approve. Dr. Laura Bartlett. Approve. Chester Farley. Approve. Tom Minowitz. Approve. Lori Lewis. Approve. Dr. Amy Steele. Approved. Diane Layden. Approved. Um, and Pam Edwards, I do not approve but the motion carries. So this will be tabled until the January meeting. Thank you. Moving on to item M19, uh, determination of program approval status for Central Piedmont Community College. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Lewis. Oh, that was a good one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Central Piedmont Community College is a Public Community College in Charlotte, North Carolina, and is a member of the North Carolina Community College system. 
the institution submitted an application to establish a practical nursing program in the spring of the year. And the proposed three semester program will require 44 total credit hours, 14 of which are non-nursing credit hours and then 30 nursing credit hours. Central Piedmont Community College proposes admitting a maximum of 24 students in January of 2022 with the first graduating class anticipated in December 2022. And the program will be physically located on the Central Piedmont Community College campus in Charlotte, North Carolina. Please note that that is a revision and the physical location. It was initially incorrectly reported in your board packet, but that that revision has been made. Thank you. The application and subsequent site visit conducted on July 22nd, 2021 affirm that the institution has sufficient learning, financial and human resources, as well as adequate support services and the physical facilities to initiate and sustain the program. There were no recommendations resulting from the on-site survey. And of course, more detail regarding the program application to include the proposed clinical sites is included in the report that you have in your board packet. The program director, Dr. Jeanette Cheshire, along with Ann Moss, faculty for the program are available today should you have any additional questions. The recommendation of board staff is that Central Piedmont Community College be granted initial approval for a practical nursing program with an approval for a max total enrollment of 24 students to begin January 2022. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Do I have a motion to accept staff's recommendation? This is Andrea. I'll make a motion. Oh, go ahead. Um, is that you, Dr. Milner? Yes. I make um, a motion. Dr. Milner has made the motion that the board approve Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte uh, to be granted initial approval for the establishment of a practical nurse diploma program with an approval maximum total enrollment of 24 students to begin January or spring of 2022. Do I have a second? I'll second. Uh, was that Lynetta? This Thank you. Laura. Lynetta Howard has seconded the motion. Any think, further discussion about this program? I, Madam Chair, I think that was Laura Bartlett. Yes, Laura. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Hard for I me didn't. to see the, the light up. Thank you, Laura. Um, Laura Bartlett has seconded the motion. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll call for the vote. When your name is called, please respond to prove if you're in favor of the motion or opposed if you are not in favor of the motion. Dr. Anne Marie Milner? Approved. Arlene Imes? Approved. Lynetta Howard? Approved. Andrea Jepson? Approved. Kimberly McKnight? Approved. Dr. Raquel Ingram? Approved. Dr. LaDonna Thomas? Approved. Dr. Laura Bartlett? Approved. Chester Farley? Approved. Tom Minowitz. Approved. Lori Lewis. Approved. Dr. Amy Steele. Approved. Diane Layden. Approved. And Pam Edwards approved. Motion carries. Um, and now back to Dr. Terry Ward for Cleveland Community College. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Cleveland Community College is a public community college in Shelby, North Carolina, and is a member of the North Carolina Community College system. The institution submitted an application to establish an associate degree in nursing program with an LPN to ADN entry option placement. The proposed five semester ADN program will require 70 to 75 credit hours, 27 to 28 credit hours of non-nursing and 43 to 47 nursing credits. The LPN to ADN entry option will require 47 nursing credit hours. The college proposes to admit a maximum total enrollment of 120 students to the nursing program. 
This is enrollment for both pathways combined. The proposed date for the admission to the first class of the nursing program is spring 2022. Graduation of the first class is anticipated in spring 2023. The application and subsequent site visit conducted August 23rd, 2021 affirms that the institution has sufficient learning, financial and human resources, as well as adequate support services and physical facilities to initiate and sustain the program. There were no recommendations resulting from the on-site survey. More detail regarding the program application is included in the consultant report and the program director and WISE is available today should you have more specific questions. The recommendation of the board staff is that Cleveland Community College be granted initial approval for an associate degree nursing program with an LPN to ADN entry option for a maximum total enrollment of 120 students to begin in January or spring of 2022. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Uh, and when you make a motion, please say your name. It's just kind of hard to, to tell who's speaking. Do I have a motion to accept staff's recommendation? This is Tom. I would like to make a motion to accept staff's recommendation for Cleveland Community College. Thank you. Uh, Tom Minowitz has made a motion that the board approve Cleveland Community College to be granted initial approval for an associate degree program in nursing and licensed practical nurse to associate degree entry option with an approvable approval for maximum total enrollment of 120 students who began in January 2022. Do I have a second? Ms. Kimberly, I second. Kimberly McKnight has seconded the motion. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions for the program director? May I just please ask one question? Yes. Um, with the so this is 16 months um, and so they're going to start if approved in spring of 22 and then they will finish in 23. That's what I heard. Dr. Ward, can you clarify or the program director perhaps? I'll clarify on behalf of the program. The program will enter students into their LPN to ADN program, which will re result in their first class graduating. Uh, in 2023, their first LPN to ADN bridge, their ADN pathway, they will graduate in the spring of 2024. Thank you, Dr. Answer, Dr. Ingram. Yes, okay. thank you, Madam Chair. All right, we have a, a motion and a second and have had some discussion. We'll now call for the vote. When your name is called, please respond to proof if you're in favor of the motion or opposed if you're not in favor of the motion. Dr. Anne-Marie Milner. Approve. Arlene Imes. Approve. Lynetta Howard. Approve. Andrea Jepson. Approved. Kimberly McKnight. Approved. Dr. Raquel Ingram. Approve. Led Dr. LaDonna Thomas. Approve. Dr. Laura Bartlett. Approve. Duster Farley. Approve. Tom Minowitz. Approve. Lori Lewis. Approve. Dr. Amy Steele. Approved. Diane Layden. Approved. And Pam Edwards, I approved. The motion carries. Hey, we don't need election results. So does this move us to M21? It does. It does. So yes. Uh, so now we have the presentation of resolutions and plaques and uh, we truly have a working board. Our board members, they don't just show up three times a year for our board meetings, but they are here every month and um, certainly serving on committees and attending conferences and staying current. So we really appreciate our board members uh, volunteering for this prestigious uh, role as a board member. So uh, at this time, the Board of Nursing recognizes the board members whose terms have ended. And at this time, we'd like to recognize um, these board members. So in appreciation of Dr. Pam Edwards, Lori Lewis, Ashley 
the North Carolina Board of Nursing is charged with the responsibility of regulating the practice of nursing in order to assure safe nursing care for the public. And whereas membership on the board reflects a commitment to the public and the profession and a willingness to provide leadership in nursing in North Carolina and whereas board activities have required much time and energy from members and whereas you have willingly and actively participated in numerous activities as a member of the board, therefore be it resolved that the North Carolina Board of Nursing recognizes and expresses appreciation for the many contributions made by you and the leadership role you have provided in North Carolina and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be attached to the minutes of this meeting and a copy be given to you. So since we are virtual, there's only one actual uh, person to accept the awards, but uh, Sandra is gonna help me. Um, let's see, Les, this is, uh, since Pam's here, well, Dr. Edwards, Thank you. It's your appreciation for being a board Thank member. Thank you, and um, Lori, it's one with your name here. <laughs> yes, so we have one for each of you. Um, Beautiful. Thank you. And this award's very special because um, it's being the chair of the board. And, you know, Dr. Edwards, she has given years to this board. And I have known her for many years, and um, we just appreciate her so much. You know, I had dinner with our previous CEO, Julie George, last night, and Julie says, you know, Pam broke me in. It's my first year <laughs> as CEO, and um, she's broken me in, too. And so uh, we're just both eternally grateful and for all that you've done. So thank you for being our chair. Thank we you. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you so much. Oh, it's clear why this is the best board in the country. Best yes. staff, best board members. Thank you all for your support. Great, thank you. And Dr. Milner, I'm sorry that you're not here, but um, we will have this for you. And uh, we appreciate all your work as vice chair. And we're looking forward to you being chair for 2022. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who received a award today. Thank you. So it looks like we are, um, we have no items for closed session. So uh, I think I'll need a motion to adjourn. Tom, you're always the one that does this. <laughs> this is Tom, I'll make the motion that we adjourn. <laughs> we have a motion to adjourn. Now we have to do debriefing. Um, Lynetta seconds. <laughs> and Lynetta second. Um, all in favor say yes. I don't have to call your names this time, apparently. Yes. 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 The motion carries. Um, the meeting is adjourned. Um, so you'll need to disconnect and join the, the team's discussion debriefing room. <laughs> I'm going to leave my stuff. Okay. Back okay. Back.